Life is pretty hectic. You've got to manage all sorts of things from relationships, work, family, just to bring it all together, just to to keep your sanity in some cases. And then if you add on top of that starting a business, it just makes the whole lot worse. How do you balance all that? How do you maintain the relationships with your close partners? How do you maintain relationships with your children? All of this comes together and is answered in this great interview with Victor Calbrees, the founder and director of DeskSide. Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello and welcome to the Share.Care podcast. Our belief is that global peace starts at home. Feeling safe, valued and heard gives you a foundation to confidently step out and make the world a happier and safer place for everyone. Because in today's world, it's in your own selfish best interest to help others. And today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Victor Calbrees. Victor is a technology and self-improvement speaker and the author of Accessing Your True Potential, Four Core Principles to Being the Best Version of You. He's a proven problem solver. He has an uncanny knack um, to be able to connect with people, and he helps you solve both business and personal challenges that are holding you back. Welcome, Victor. How are you, Dean? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. And yourself, you having a good start to the year? Yeah, fantastic starts. Actually, the the end of the year business wise was uh, uh, was great, and it's just flown into 2023. So, yeah, very blessed. Fantastic. Great to hear. Well, to get to what you're doing and, and having that those blessings that you've got, do you want to take it back a little bit and tell us a bit about you know your background and what led you to do what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, uh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> well, what are the key drivers that, that you know, because I think for most people, we have these underlying principles that drive us. And that seems to come from some key points in our history, whether it was when we were young or or not, but usually something that happened when we were younger shapes us a little bit, and then and then that molds over time. Yeah. So um, I I was born in Italy. I was born in Sicily, and at six years old, we came to the United States, um, and we were, uh, I mean, poor. In Italy, we were very well off, and then we came to the United States, and my father had to start over. Yeah. Uh, my father and my mother were both entrepreneurs um, since the very beginning, so I grew in an entrepreneurial household. Yeah. Um, and when I graduated college, the first thing I told my parents is there is no freaking way I am going to own my own business. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I've seen the ups and downs. I saw what the struggles and, you know, for anybody that's an entrepreneur, know exactly even if you with the success that comes, um, there is a lot of fighting in, in, in the yeah. early on, beginning. Right. So I, I started working for people and I was very, very successful as an employee. Uh, I was a, a chief information officer for a construction company at 27 years old. Yeah. They were about $55 million a year. So I, I was very successful, but there was something inside of me uh, that, that was not fulfilled. Yeah. Uh, and at a certain point, I decided to start my own business and start my own journey. And since technology was in my blood, I decided to, to start a technology company. Um, and, and I've never been happier. Uh, I've been at it now for the last six years and, uh, loving every second, even though it's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Fantastic. Is that something when you talk about the starting of the business and obviously, you know, it's hard to start is, and from a business perspective, a lot of businesses, um, as you're aware, don't, don't last past five years or even make it to five years. Do you think that's 
partly because people underestimate what's required in in physical capital and emotional capital um, to to start a business, and and they they actually don't have enough. Yeah, I mean, the biggest part that I tell people, and and I I love helping um, young entrepreneurs and people that you know want to try to make it. And one of the things that I tell them um, when we have conversations early on is, do you have the grit? Because you you can never allow a failure because there's going to be numerous failures along your path. Um, I, I don't care how much money you got or how how much um, experience or how good your product is. I've seen fantastic products fail. Yeah. Um, so it's one of those things where you have to have the grit and you have to have the willpower to make it through. Um, when I started my business, just to give everybody an idea, you know, I, I'm a father of five. I had a mortgage, you know, yeah. wife. I had the, the the whole package, right? So I had to still pay all my bills. Um, obviously, a lot harder to start at that point. When yeah. you're younger, it's a little easier. But it all comes down to grit. Do you have that entrepreneurial spirit to actually make it through the challenges that you were surely going to be faced by? And is that really when you're talking about this grit and because and – you mentioned about. I want to come back to some of the motivations later, but while we're on this this grit topic um, and experience, because you started business, you obviously had you know five children. That's a lot to manage, and you know, uh, your wife, you've got to keep happy, and that can be a challenge at times too, as as we know. Um, and and you've got to earn income and, and provide that. I'm not sure the situation whether your wife was working at the same time, but I can imagine with five children, there's a lot to manage, and you know you you're either one person's going to be at home or you've got someone, you're paying someone to help look after the children. Um, so I'm imagining it's one of those. Uh, I'm not sure which, but. Yeah, so so my wife wasn't working at the time. We actually sold our house and yeah. that's how we got by in the early on. It's, it's like whatever equity we have in the house, that's, that's what we had. And we came down to very close to the bottom of the barrel uh, mm. when everything started turning around. Um, my wife now is an entrepreneur as well. So, so we own four businesses in total. So uh, being, being an overachiever, I didn't start one business, I started four <laughs> at the same time. Um, but my wife started her business, uh, just three years ago. Um, and that one's going fantastic as well. So she was at home, she was taking care of the kids, uh, you know, but, uh, there was definitely the, the financial was the biggest challenge and the financial was the biggest excuse not to do that. Because again, I, I was providing a really good life for my family, right? Yeah. It's a big decision to go from there to all of a sudden being out on your own. That's, yeah, and I want to touch on that because it, that's a, a really important that you've highlighted, a, a really point, important point that you've highlighted there in the sense of, you know, you've got a secure um, family life, good income, um, you've, and then you've got things that you've got to provide for. You've got five children that you've you've got to look after, um, and I'm assuming they weren't at, of the age where they can look after themselves. They're, they needed parents to look after them. And you're nodding for the people that are um, that are just listening and not watching. <laughs> <laughs> and what I want to understand is because this seems to be one of the key factors of success in a business, um, and it's something you know a, a quote that I I think I made up, but it was no amount of skill can fix a poor partner choice. Now here. You're in a situation where you're married, got five children to look after, and you're deciding, I'm going to start a business, we're going to sell our house and use that equity to start the business. How important was that relationship and the strength of the relationship to allow that to happen? And what did you do to to, to nurture that strength during those tough times? Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic question. I, I mean, without the support of my wife, there was no way I would have been successful, Right. Um, I not only needed her support, but I needed her to say it was okay. So I, I'm the risk taker, risk taker in, in the relationship. My wife is very, very cool headed. She just requires a lot of information, slow decisions. And I'm like, let's go, you know, let's make, let's, let's just get <laughs> anything. Let's go. go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, uh, so, you know, there was a lot of talks, there was a lot of, well, you know, how are we going to plan for this? How are we going to plan for that? Because there's the little things that 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 nobody really thinks about that kind of hit you from left field and not they're not so little like uh health insurance you know here in the US you know if you don't have health insurance you you got to pay cash for stuff it's very very hard i mean yeah. something like uh, a, a a cold is can be very expensive let alone a kid breaking a leg or something like that right yeah. so you had to think through those those things 
Because even if you were to buy it yourself, you're talking about thousands of dollars a month that would start coming out of the, the bank. So we yeah. talked through everything. Um, luckily, I had enough experience to actually put a real business plan together and actually put numbers on paper that I could show her and say, this is how it's going to uh, yeah. work out. A lot of times when you when you first start, when you don't, don't have the experience that I have, you put things on paper that aren't really real. Yeah. Um, and you give yourself like a, a full sense of, oh, I just need three months and I'm going to be fine. I'm going to make it half a million dollars a year in three months. Right. And yeah. it, it, it's really Never heard not that like before that. from any of those ads on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's some, some people do it. Some, there's some people that if for whatever reason, just get lucky and, you know, yeah. boom. Yeah. There are those stories. That's true. But from your perspective, yeah. when you're, you're talking about, cause you mentioned, you know, you've sold your house use the equity for the house so and that's that's move you know that's coming down and then you said it almost got to the bottom if i heard you correctly yeah it was scary talk, talk through that experience again from a relationship perspective with your wife what started going on when you're starting to get to the bottom i mean we've all heard the story of you know elon musk talking about how you know he he threw the last dollars that he had 60 million <laughs> into yeah. tesla um yeah. But you know, and and but from your perspective, it's a little bit different. And and I would say from a lot of people's perspective who would relate to what you're doing, it's like, well, you know, how do you manage that? How you, yes, you've put together this wonderful business plan that you know, and it's got a lot of foundation to it and a lot of strength to it. But all of a sudden, sudden, you've got to be starting to question, you know, am I doing the right thing here? And and how did you talk through that with your wife? Yeah, it was it was it was rough, man. Uh, it, there was uh, there was a point where my wife and I had a really tough conversation. You, know, my wife's originally from Argentina, mm. and one of the conversations we were having is, you know, her going back to her country with the kids until I got myself up and running because it really got to that point. Yeah. Um, and I remember I, I'm part of a, a Vistage group, uh, um, which is a group of uh, professionals we meet once a month, um, mm. and and I remember being in that meeting in tears with my vistage group um and they really didn't have any solutions for me right yeah. because at a certain point it's like you either got to go get a job or you got to get you got to make this work yeah um so it, it was it was one of those things where you have to have the tough conversations we had the tough conversation with my wife we were planning for the worst um and i just kept going and eventually it did turn around um and it, it got better but i can definitely see how it could have went completely to the other side where um i would have had to give up on my dream and shut down all the businesses that i had started and go and gotten a job yeah and is that where that uh grit kicked in it's like i've got to keep pushing forward so, so the, the grit's constant so because it there's See, when you're working for someone, you pretty know, much know what's expected. Even at a, at a VP or an executive level, you know what's expected of you. You're getting your paycheck every single day. You can yeah. compartmentalize the business day and your personal life. You can't do that as a business owner. Yeah. Um, and, and and honestly, when you're successful, that's the great part of being a business owner is that you don't have to. Business and personal are all intermingled. You know, If I wanted to get up today and go to my kid's uh, soccer game, I can. I have zero problem with doing that. You can't really do that when you're working for someone. So that's the benefits of if you make it. it when you're you're not making it, what that it kind of uh, turns into is you're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? Yeah, mm. I was I was in sleeping for the most part because my head was always going. Was all right. Where am I going to go next? What's the next networking event? How am I going to get this off the ground? Where am I going to get the financing for the next round of uh, uh, for the next couple of weeks? Um, so you start putting all those challenges. The grit's always there. You have yeah. to keep going. You have to be looking. I mean, the best advice I can give for people is surround yourself before you go on this journey. Surround yourself with as many mentors as you can get. Um, mm. there's a lot of great people out there that are willing to help others and you just kind of help each other. And if it wasn't for all the people in my, in my world that were just kind of, you know, lifting me up when I was really down or giving me the advice I needed when I didn't know what to do, um, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. And how much of that is experience, you know, working through that, like you say, s surround yourself with mentors. And I'll, I'll use two examples here. Uh, my son uh, does karate and I was talking with his sensei um, who's become a close friend and we we're talking about whether something's hard or easy. And I said, well, 
harder is, is relative to your experience. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you're a, a seventh Dan black belt. Now, if I asked you to do grading at a yellow belt level, how difficult would that be? And and he said, well, it'd be pretty easy. And I said, well, it's not that the the work is hard. It's it's what your experience is compared to that work. And I put that in the context of business with another friend of mine who's a, a venture capitalist. And um, you know, he, we were having coffee talking about that. And he goes, well, business is actually pretty simple. There's certain key things. If you understand that, then you can look at a business and know, or in your case, look at a business plan and know whether it's going to be successful or not. And part of that business plan is the experience of the people within the business. Um, and you know, to his credit too, one of his investments that he a business that he assessed and invested in ended up being sold to Oracle for one point six billion dollars. Um, mm-hmm. So, and and he's had a history of of those kind of things and knowing what to do. How much of it do you think, from your perspective, when you look back at it now, um, is the learning process of understanding what you needed to understand to make it successful. Like, for example, if you were to do it again now, uh, I'd imagine the process would be much simpler than from when you first started because of that experience. Is that is that a true statement or from your experience? Yeah, well? yeah, absolutely. I mean, experience to me is is like a, a, a fast forward button, um, right? Because I did have a lot of business experience going into this, and if mm. if if not, I would I would not have made it. Yeah. Um, I really, I really. I didn't have enough funding um, for any more time than what what I gave myself. Right, so yeah. experience is definitely huge. Um, a buddy of mine started a, a similar IT company back in the early two thousands, and it took him seventeen years mm. to get to where I got in three. Right, yeah. because you know he didn't have any funding. He was yeah. out of college. He had no experience. He really started in a basement of his dad's house. Right, so yeah. little by little, but he he built a company. It took him seventeen years, and he exited. He sold it. Um, he did really good for him. And now, fast forward, you know, I came from a different angle. I I'm not just graduating out of college. I have a lot of business experience. I know technology. Um, I've been a C level executive at, at, at multiple levels of different industries. So for me, it was like I hit the floor running. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, you only have so much, and at a certain point, you know, getting a business started, you better get it done in that amount of time, or you're you're out. You, you know, there's nothing else there because you are the business owner. There's nobody else to go to. Yeah. So how do you? With that, with no one else to go to, and and you say you've got to hit the round, hit the ground running. But yeah. how do you make that assessment? How do you know what you need to know to decide? Okay, I need to do this. I'm thinking of um, if I'm going to be truthful here and and say that I'm actually a huge NASCAR fan, so I'm a bit of a, na- a redneck. Um, okay, <laughs> but I remember watching um a documentary on Richard Petty, and he was talking about his dad. Um, when he wanted to race, his dad said, "No, you you need to get more experience before you get out. You'll do so much more. You'll get you you need more learning before you actually get out there and race." And he was just wanting to get out there and race. But you know, now we look back in history, the what his dad taught him actually helped him become you know obviously the most successful NASCAR driver in history. How much of that is you know from your own self discipline when thinking about going to business, going doing a proper self self assessment? And saying, well, maybe I need to gain a little bit more experience before throwing all my capital and equity at this. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, that that was my, I don't know if it was uh, detrimental to me, but that's why it took me so long to start my own business is, is because of what you're saying, right? I kept yeah. assessing, am I ready? Am I ready? Am I ready? And and there was a part of me that didn't feel like or was scared. Mm. Um, you know, what I what I tell people that that I mentor is there is nothing wrong with a side hustle because yeah. a side hustle allows you to start, but really just have one foot, you know, in the safety zone. At a yeah. certain point, you're going to have to just put it all out there and see and see what happened. I mean, um, even that side started as sort of a side hustle and we, and we had some revenue in there before I took the leap um, into the company and put everything, you know, all my bills and all my, my salary into here. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely one of those things that, you're never going to be ready. I, mm. At least I don't think so. Because if you're always looking for that perfection, you're you're going to be waiting the rest of your life. I made mistakes with all the experience I made. I, you know, I made mistakes with marketing. I made mistakes with hiring people. I made mistakes with sales. But you learn and you keep going. Where the experience kicks in is your ability to learn from your mistakes and then just yeah. change them and go. That's where yeah. experience really helps you. 
Yeah, I, I love that. that. That ability to learn from mistakes. It's something um, from my perspective anyway that I, I really suffered badly from was an ability to listen when I was younger. <laughs> I knew everything. We all <laughs> <gonna> be told. <laughs> but how much, I mean, from your process, this ability to listen, um, how much, how did you learn that? And, and you know, how would you encourage someone to, to really pay attention to what's going on? Because like you say, perfection is not ever going to happen. Some t- mm-hmm. At some point, you've got to make the leap. But then being able to make the leap and listen um, seems to be a, a very critical factor to succeeding. How would you so, encourage people to do that? Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the greatest skills that I, I've been a part of Vistage now for uh, close to ten years. But one of the things that I learned early on in Vistage is they they kind of teach you to make yourself or or because. I'm a very intelligent man. I know that I'm very intelligent. But when you walk into a room, you have to learn to say mm. to yourself, I am not the smartest person in this room. Mm. Everyone else in this room can teach me something. And if yeah. you go in there with that mindset, you're always going to come out ahead. It's that person that thinks they know it all and then yeah. goes out there and they fail. And it's like, why did I fail? I, I know everything that I need to know. And it could be that you knew everything needed and you still failed. But the idea is don't think yourself as the smartest person in the room. Understand that there's a lot of things you can learn, and then you just go out there, give it your best shot. When you fail, just take that failure as a as a as a moment of learning, then reassess and move on. Yeah, and from that perspective of that learning, I mean, when you were doing this, like you say, you went through this process. You've sold your house. You, the equity is that you've got in the family is diminishing, mm-hmm. and you're working flat out. Can you describe for me the time management, particularly with your family and your kids? You've got five kids, so that's that's a lot of you know effort to to spend time with all of them and to have that quality time. And you know, as you say, it took three years to get this up and running, if if I understood that correctly. Yeah. So that and you're working flat out for those three years. Can you describe what that was like from that perspective? Because to me, it sounds like there was a whole bunch of time, you know, depending on what your a person's priorities are that you might miss out you might go well is it worth me losing that time with my kids to be able to to set this up what was your experience like as far as that time management that family time during that 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 period yeah so and that was one of the conversations i had with my wife and it was that was one of the things that 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 she was worried about right is is how much of this the kids going to suffer and one of the things that she made me promise is that no matter what happens in the business uh, during this time, we both agreed that we have to do everything in our power to shelter the kids. Yeah. Um, so whatever that was, they had Christmas, they had their birthdays, they had their birthday parties, like all that stuff never stopped. So we did go from owning a house to renting a home, mm. uh, but it was still a similar size house, right? So we sheltered the kids as best we could. The time that was uh, uh, earmarked for family it was earmarked for family, and we made sure that that I was there. I was part of it. Um, where I end up suffering is anything that was, you know, my personal life in the sense of, you know, hobbies or activities that I used to be able to do. Um, they just went out the out the window, right? There was a point where I was able to go to the gym every day, and now I wasn't able to go to the gym as much anymore, right? I wasn't able to take care of myself as much, so that stuff sort of suffered. I still found a way to kind of hold it all together um, mm. because it's also important for an entrepreneur to understand that, that you have to take care of yourself yeah. because if you don't, um, you're definitely going to fail. There, There is not a doubt in my mind because the grind is too hard. And if you can't take care of your mental, your heart, your physical, you will not make it. Yeah. How did you do that? I mean, well, actually, before we get to that, I want to again stay on the, the kid um, thing for a minute because with children – I mean, it sounds like you planned that very well with your wife and made sure, okay, birthdays, Christmases, these key events. But what about other things like, you know, school plays, those kind of things? Um, And then just having that daily, because I would imagine that you're working um, flat out and the kids are young, they they will be going to bed before you actually get home. Um, That because that happens quite a lot was if that's not your circumstance, correct me. But um, if so, I was lucky because that. So I was lucky because I, I I did start Death Side. You know, I when I started Death Side, I did have a, a revolution in mind. Like I, there was things that I wanted to change about the company. And one of the things that I I did do was I wanted a full remote workforce. So I've got people working all over the United States. Yeah. Um, I do have offices, 
Um, but they're not offices where I force everybody to come into the office. And that includes myself. I like coming to your office now. At the yeah. time, we couldn't afford an office. So I was working from home. Right. Um, so that does make it a little easier because you did not have to go somewhere. So when the kids came home from school, I was there. Um, we had dinner together every night as a family. Um, you know, the plays and stuff. It, it, there was times that I had to miss things. You know, if I was at a, a client meeting or if I was at a networking event, um, you know, I would miss it. Luckily, my wife was there to pick up those pieces. Uh, but we were able to do almost everything as, as a family. You know, that's one of the things we fought really hard to make sure that, you know, we didn't give up. Um, and being your own boss, it's it's a little easier, actually, to do that because I can go somewhere at three o'clock, you know, till five. And then mm. come back and work from six to eight, six to ten, or whatever it takes, you know, to get the stuff done. Yeah. How did that, from that perspective, and because I want to touch on that with the, the kids as well, because I'm talking, like, thinking about my own experience with that. Um, for example, with my son, there's been times where, um, from an early age, where I've been busy, and you know what kids are like, they'll come to you and say, "I need, I want to, you know, I want to tell you this," and and sometimes you'll take that. But there was times very deliberately I said to my son, and and I'm not in your case. I only had one. Well, I had two um, stepdaughters, but you know they became adults um, much earlier. But I had one son, and so there. But I very deliberately said to him at certain times, even if it wasn't I said, "I need to deal with this. You just need to wait a minute." So go and do what you need to do, and and then I will come and find you and, and talk to you about that. But I, I I trained him or taught him early on that it's not just, you know, you're going to get whatever it is you need straight away. We need to balance this between the both of us. And that you know, had an impact, a, a great impact from our relationship perspective. He, he's 14 now, and, and we balance things very, very nicely and have a good respect for each other. How did you, you know, deal with those situations where you couldn't be there for events? Because I did that similar sort of thing where I couldn't be there. It's like, I love you very much. I've got something on. I can't be there. Um, but I'll be thinking about you and, and just let him know that I that I loved him. And it wasn't a case of, you know, he felt um, it was about making him feel loved regardless of whether I was there or not. Did, were there things like that that you did with your children as well? Or how did you make Because you've got five. I can't, you know, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I, I take them to school every day. So that, that ride in the car, I make sure it's not just a ride, right? Yeah. So we talk and, and, and we play music and we have fun and I get them ready. Yeah. Um, you know, I do all the cooking in the house. So, you know, it's one of those things where I try to get them involved. It's like, what do you guys want to eat? But absolutely what you're saying is something that's happened to us. I mean, I mean, my, my, my little one come in and wanted to show me something on his iPad, you know, and there was some times that I was very focused on what I was doing. And I would tell him, you know, Val, you, you're going to have to give me a second. I'll be right back. But I mean, I guess the trick there is to make sure that if you push him away for whatever reason, if you can't take the time right then and there, because I'm really good about making sure that if I can take the time, I'm going to do it right then and there because they don't really want that much time for you. Right. Yeah. But there was some times where you're, you're deep, knee deep in an Excel spreadsheet, you're thinking you, you don't want to lose that connection. Um, as long as you go back to them, I think they're very receptive. I mean, it's a nice life lesson to teach them as well, because, you know, life's not always going to be available to you when you want it to be. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you teach them that early on, they'll be okay. You know, the one thing that you don't want to do is, is, is push them away with, you know, anger or with, yeah, I can't talk to you right now. Just, just be, just be more uh, aware that you don't want to hurt their feelings. And as long as you do that, I mean, my kids were fine. I mean, they, they understood that daddy was busy or we're doing something and then we just get to back together later on. Yeah. Beautiful. Cause I wanted to t really touch on that because I mean, Life is busy. We, we have you know, difficulty managing life and certainly people have that difficulty with you know, work-life balance. And I feel from people that I've talked to, there's a number of um, this thinking out there that you, know, we, you have to always be devoted to your kids, otherwise they're not going to turn out right. But it's there. It's more about whether you love them or not. Is was my experience, and it sounds like you had a sort of similar experience. And teach them that you know sometimes life does push back, and you've just got to wait. But if you show them that you always love them, then that's okay. And I just wanted to make that point clear um, for the listeners that you know you don't have to be <laughs> this constantly dropping everything for your children. 
so one of one of the one of the best books I ever read was the Five Law of Languages, um, and it's really a relationship book. But there is one, the Five Law of Languages of, of Kids, and 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 the important thing that I learned from that book is not it's not so much about showing love; it's making sure you're showing love to your kids or your partner in the manner that they're receptive to it. Right. Yeah. Because some people need to be touched. Other people need to have just you and them talking for an extended period of time. You know, so there's yeah. different ways to show love. And in the book, they talk about five different ways. And it's true. When I was reading it, I was like, oh, this this is great. Because like, I'm not one of those people like another way is uh, gifts. So mm-hmm. when you give somebody a gift, some people are very receptive to that. So me, I'm like, you give me a gift. I, I'm thankful for it. But it doesn't that's not a that's yeah. not my love language. Right? I relate that. Um, to that yeah. So and your kids are like that, too, just because just because they're um, your kids doesn't mean they speak the same love language. And some some stuff fills their love tank and some stuff doesn't. Um, so it's a very cool book. I tell everybody, all your readers should just definitely um, uh, pick that one up. It's It's made a big difference in my relationship. Uh, my wife is definitely a gifts person, so you know, <laughs> lots home, of little roses and stuff like that. Yeah. The end of the world, but she's more about time too. Like when it's time, she loves to talk. Yeah, uh, I'm not a big talker, right? But when she wants to talk, it's really important to her that I sit there and I put all my phone, everything away, and I sit there and I just give her the attention that she wants, and then that makes her day. Yeah. That's interesting. I want to touch on that too, because with the and I really said so I really want to get into this because. A lot of times we don't get into the this foundation that is what makes a a business work. Having that there, and you, like you say with your wife, you know that she needs that um, that listening when she, when she's talking, and you actively put things deliberately put things away so that you can focus on her and, and get get that love. What about you know from the perspective of balance as well? I mean, you're going through this very busy period of setting up your life, uh, setting up your business, I should say, and then you know how do you have that time to maintain? that romance i mean there's two key areas where divorce comes about it's like after the first kid uh, the first child comes because the whole dynamic of the relationship changes and all of a sudden people don't make the right adjustments similar when you're starting a business it is kind of like having a child you're so you know the whole dynamic of your life has suddenly changed before you had time to go out on you know regular dates and 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 you can fill that love bank as they talk about in in the the five languages of, of love books um, how did you find that time? Same thing with your your wife to actually maintain that romance, so that you know it, it didn't your relationship didn't fall apart. So again, I'm lucky because with 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 Lou, uh, my wife, um, as long as you give her time, so mm-hmm. you sat there and just we had a decent conversation. She doesn't have to have the fancy dinner. She doesn't have to have the vacation. She likes it. No, mm-hmm. you know she's just like every other person out there. She loved to have those things. Um, but her thing is really about just spending quality time together. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a little easier. Um, and the same way that, that I found the time for the kids, I had to make time for her. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there there was something that I learned early on when I, when I was in in college that one of my college professors told me is like in life, you could, you can categorize life into three buckets. It's going to be finances, your health and your relationships. And you can only take care of two out of three things at any given time. Right. So one of them is going to suffer. And it's going back to what you're saying, because if you're dedicated to your health and your finances and you're a hundred percent, all your energy is going that, that relationship is going to go to crap. Um, yeah. And there's nothing you could do about it. So the trick and what he uh, had then came out and told us is you can never give a hundred percent of your energy to any one thing. You have mm. to always be cognizant of the fact that there's going to be things that you're going to have to a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. Does that make everything move a little slower? Absolutely. You know, because if you give 100 percent energy, let's say, to your finances, that that financial part of your life is going to get great. And most people, there's a lot of people that do that. But then mm. every other piece of their life is is going to go bad. So the trick is a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, come back to the first, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, come back to the first. I guess that also depends on what your objective is as well. And there's some people out there that just just go hard and they love that that work. And as you say, that they they're focusing on the maybe it's the money, but the achievement within whatever it is profession that they do. And there's people that just really drive for that, and and they um, they probably take care of their health very well. And the, the style I'm talking because they have to, otherwise they can't continue to drive that way. But you notice that they're constantly having you know. Right. relationship issues um right. but that's their objective they're, they're quite happy with that but 
from your perspective, it depends, you know, you, for you, the, the family was really important as well. So even though you say that you're going a little bit slower, but what you're managing there was a holistic life and a long-term view, it sounds like. Does that is that sum that up? or And how did yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and again, it goes back to experience, right? Mm. Uh, younger, I would, I would definitely have put all my time into finance, take care of myself a little bit, but it would have been more about pushing, 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 pushing. Um, you know, move forward in life. Now I realize that you have to have some sort of balance because um, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a long life, and if you don't use time to your advantage, you're really being foolish. Yeah. Well, from that using that time to the advantage, what about because you you're talking about you know you've got life, health, and relationships. Sorry, mm -hmm. just you know writing that down, and you're balancing it between the two. Now, like you were saying, using time to your advantage. Now you know from from understanding your wife that she needs to um, have that listening time. And you know, if you were to do something else, you wouldn't get you know, <clears throat> to quote a phrase as much bang for your buck, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So you might do these things that are not as you know that you think are, are, are good, but it's a lot of effort, but it's not getting the result. Whereas you know, I need to give my wife this time, and that's going to result in a, a big return on the other areas that you need to focus on. How important was recognizing that, and how do you go about recognizing what are the efficient things to give you the results that you need to get? It's it's tough. It's a tough question because you know life's going to throw uh, throw you a bunch of curveballs and it's going to throw a bunch of stuff at you. You, you got to just take it one at a time. Um, the the biggest lesson you know to answer your your question, Damon, is is really keep the emotions out of it and try to be very logical. Uh, at least that's the way I look at it. Wow. So when when I when I realize, like I could not have done what I did without the support of my wife, and if I did not feed my wife what she needed, she would not be able to support me in what I needed. So it yeah. all kind of makes sense if you start looking at it from a holistic uh, uh, um, system of, of items, right? So when something gets thrown at me, whether it's children or it's the house or it's the business or it's the wife, I look at it as like, okay, well, we have to keep all this stuff go moving forward. And mm -hmm. how do you do that is, you know, just make sure you give it a little bit of attention, a little bit of attention and just keep going forward. Yeah, great. I, I, I love that. Um, because it, and I know I spent a bit of time focusing on this, but uh, I really believe that it's fundamental if you're going to succeed. Unless you're one of those drivers that is not really interested in a relationship, um, then you know having that time to nurture that relationship. Because the downside of that, as as a number of people have experienced, um, and it's, it's quoted as being one of the greatest destroyers of wealth, is divorce. And not only is it a destroyer of wealth, it's a destroyer of your you know many emotions that you have to deal with, and it creates a very difficult time but if you plan very well for this not only will you have a thriving business but you'll have a thriving family as well which is uh, uh, if that's what you want it's it's a nice way to do that coming back to the business side of things when setting up the business and and you had a lot of experience with business plans what were some of the key things that you needed to make sure were in that business plan when you look at you know you, if you go well these are predictors of success um, what are what are some of the? I mean, yes, the, you get the common ones. Yes, you got to do a cash flow, that kind of thing. But what what are the fundamentals within a business plan that you think are really important to to have that planned out before you actually pull the trigger? Uh, the biggest thing is just be extremely pessimistic. I think that too many people are way too optimistic when it comes to putting a business plan together, um, and, and they get super excited. They get they get wrapped up in the emotions and. I have seen so many business plans in my life and it's always the same thing. It's like sales are never going to be what you think they're going to be. <laughs> um, so be super pessimistic and it's not, you know, I don't want you, I don't want, I don't want the people to take it as, as, cause I'm very optimistic. I'm a very optimistic person, yeah. um, but you have to downplay that because if you um, go down and say, this is the bare minimum, I know I can achieve this and the business works with their bare minimum. You know, everything on top of that will be gravy. Yeah. But if you go in there and make your bare minimum so high and they say, I'm going to be a millionaire in, uh, you know, the, the next 12 months, mm. the chances are that that you're not going to achieve that. And and it's very easy to do, to do that. Um, I keep telling um, um, people that I have seen 
so many because I have another business uh, called Goodfellow Ventures where we invest in in other companies, right? So we actually invest into startups and you know, and we do um, 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 some venture, some some stock trading. But I've seen so <laughs> great ideas, fantastic mm-hmm. ideas that we've invested in, and they just didn't make it. Whether mm-hmm. that's because of the leadership or uh, the marketing wasn't done right or whatever the, the the reason, they just didn't make it. And they were fantastic ideas. Is that the case that when you say, because I'm coming back to your friend that you mentioned, you spent 17 years getting his business up and running, where well, you have this fantastic idea that didn't make it. Is it a case of that idea run out of resources to make it work or the market moved on and there was no point continuing to to try and make it or a very combination? So there's a bunch of them. Uh, right now, I own shares in a company called the uh, Connected Mind. It is a friggin' amazing company. Um, the 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 gentleman, the CEO that developed would actually develop an app where you give uh, the, the you, you sit in a doctor's office. The doctor gives you a tablet, and mm-hmm. the, the patient takes a test, and it has like this cascading logic of questions. So if you depending on how you answer these questions, it'll give you a different question. But pretty much what that that test does is test for six of the most common mental health issues that mm-hmm. affect physical medicine, right? Depression, mm-hmm. anxiety, somatic symptom disorder. And it'll actually give the doctor a, a, a result showing them that this person actually has depression and yeah. that's why they're feeling something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a fantastic idea. It just, it's been taking him a really long time to get off the ground and just get it to the point. And when we first had laid out the business plan, it was like, you know, to, we're going to the moon in three years and it just hasn't happened that way. And and it's something that we have saved over 2000 people from committing suicide because there's a flag on there. It tells the doctor, this person is most likely going to commit suicide, get them some help. Wow. Um, and it's, it's a fantastic product, but it just hasn't gotten the motion. Is it because it doesn't have enough money, and enough marketing? Maybe. Is it because we're not reaching the right people? Maybe. Is it because the climate wasn't ready for it? And now it's starting to turn around? Maybe. Uh, so there's a lot of questions as to why things don't work. I had another, uh, a, a buddy of mine, um, and I was involved in it. We came up with this idea for a car rental company and we started going after it. We met with very, very wealthy individual. That company never got off the ground because the amount of funding necessary to get it off the ground was enormous, right? Um, so in order to get people to buy into a startup and give you that kind of capital was hard. So that one didn't get off the ground for that reason. So there's a multitude of reasons why companies uh, can't make it, um, but they're there's plenty of great ideas out there that just don't make it. Coming, yeah, coming back to that perspective of pessimism and um, the bare minimum you need, because I, I know that from a number of people that I've spoken to that have successful businesses like yourself, and they started with that attitude. They said, "Okay, what is my bare minimum that I need to live, and how long can I last with that?" And it's it's a similar approach that I've taken. Um, well, a long time ago, I don't put myself in that position now. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But they, 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 when they're putting everything on the line, like you did, you're selling your house, you're going, okay, what is the bare minimum I, I need, and how long can that last? Um, and then, what's an option if I need to to take it further um, and need further resources? Is that like taking that pessimistic attitude? Is that something someone should go through and how would you go through that process? How do you be realistic when you've got – because I agree with you. You're saying you want to be an optimist, but there's a difference between optimism and optimism bias. Um, How do you tell the difference and how do you plan for that? So – I, I, so one of the things I measure everything. So, you know, early on in my career and I'm, I'm, I'm what's called an integrator. So um, I'm the type of person that uh, a, a person that could dream of stuff or a visionary like a CEO should be um, mm-hmm. comes up with these great ideas. They give it to someone like me and I make those ideas come to fruition. It's the way I make those ideas come to fruition and the way I know what actually will make something work as compared how to be a, a realistic pessimist um, is to measure everything. Um, so I have scorecards within all the organizations and I consistently measure, see where I'm at, see if I'm meeting those goals, see if I, and I don't wait till the end of the year because that's mm. one of the biggest mistakes people do. They'll, they'll put this business plan, go to a bank, get some funding to get started and then stop measuring. 
They're so yeah. busy in the tactical operations of the business that they stop measuring what they're doing until there's no money left in the account. And it's like, yeah. oh, what happened? So, you know, the, the, that's that's what I tell everybody. That's what I'm trying to teach my wife now because we're getting to the point with, with her company where we have to scale it. Um, and, you know, I could easily scale her company, but I don't want to do it. I want her to do it, right? Yeah. So what do you have to do is teach her. She starts to learn how to measure these things. She's starting to learn how to read the P&L and a balance sheet and start putting all these things together, start looking at the right metrics for, for, the, for, that, for that company so that when we do open up that second office, now she's able to say, hey, this is what may be successful here. I just need to reproduce that at the other, at the other company, at the other office, and then we'll have success again. And then we do it again. And we do office number three and then office number four. And we just keep growing the company that way. So my 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 answer to your question is really about measuring. Make sure that the business plan or whatever you put together to start the business isn't the last time you're measuring your success. You have to measure it consistently on a regular basis. So you have to make measuring a habit as to what you do going absolutely all the way through just constantly measuring. Yep. And with that. On the habit side of things as well, when we look at our own personal habits, and I, I wonder about this, um, and I had uh, one of my mentors was the um, the managing director and, and um, chairman of the board of BP, and he always talked about, you know, are you being realistic in the sense of what you're expecting from sales? And you mentioned that before, this optimism bias of expecting more. And are we misunderstanding what it is required? Because we assume people are just going to suddenly – jump on board and they go, oh, this is an amazing product. And and but people are creatures of habit. So they they don't just go, well, oh, here's this amazing thing and jump on board, especially when they've got to fork out money. How do we correctly interpret and, and understand this that people are creatures of habit and it's going to take time to actually change those habits. And we need to tap into a way of of doing that. Well failure will do that for you. <laughs> That's your best teacher, right? <laughs> you just, just fail yeah, your I can way. Relate to eventually, that. you got to learn from it. Um, I've seen that be a great teacher, especially even for myself. You know, yeah. I, I put something on paper. Oops, didn't make that one. Right. Yeah. And next month, I'll be sure to make it a little less because it's I, I couldn't hit it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think failure will do that. You know, when I'm talking to other people, because the reality of it is this, David. I, I mean, to be completely honest with you, anything you put on paper is a guess. Hmm. I don't I don't care what business you put together. I don't care if you yeah. are trying to be pessimistic, optimistic. At the end of the day, it's a guess. Yeah. And that's where, again, going back to your experience, if you have some experience, your guess tend to be a little better than if you don't have any experience. Hmm. If you're in a market where you've had experience, your guesses are going to be a lot better than if you've never had experience, right? Yeah. Um, you know, with this IT company, for instance, I've been in IT for the better part of 25 years, 20 years. So for me, it's it's easy to say, this is how much I'm going to close every single month. And this is how big those closes are going to be. Um, because I've been there. I've seen a successful company that we ended up selling actually do those things. So I can't put on paper anything more than an established business that I was part of could do, right? So I have a ceiling, right? Yeah. So if we were selling uh, one deal a month, then I'm not going to put two deals a month in my business plan. It just makes no sense for you to be able to do that. Yeah. So I, I think a little bit of experience failing absolutely does it. But that's why it's so important to measure on a really short, especially when you get started. Like mm. I measure now on a monthly basis. Yeah. Uh, when I first started, it was weekly. Every Friday, I would sit there and there was key indexes within the company that I was looking at. And it's not only on the sales side. It's also on the spend side, right? How are your bills? How's your bunny? How's your cash flow? Are you are you overspending in certain areas and are you cutting it back? Um, so, you know, that's what I would say to people that are starting their business. And it's like measure daily, you know, even daily if you have to when you're started, because if you have zero experience in that thing and you really don't know what you're getting, then you bring your numbers all the way back down to a day. Yeah. What are the, some of those key indexes that you measure and go? Because you mentioned it's not just sales. I had that with one of my clients. They're a large, very large company, and they were aiming for they were you know several hundred million dollar turnover. They wanted to get a billion. That was their goal. Yeah. And I said to them as part of the, this process with the the senior management, I said, "Well, what about the profit?" And they and they kind of heard but didn't really hear. 
And yeah. I said, no, it, it became this glossy thing. Oh, sales, we're going to get a million dollars in sales. And, and that became the focus. And, I, and as, as, as much as I tried to tell them, it was just like, you know, and it, they did. They hit the million dollars in, a, um, in the time period, um, but they made a loss. Because a lot of yep. the projects that they took on weren't profitable, um, they just took every every project to because that became the focus for every obviously a big company. Everyone's focus is million dollars, million dollars. So they were just writing, you know, whatever projects to get that project in, and not thinking about the other end. So when you're talking about these key metrics, what are you know some of the key ones? You know, sales is obviously one, but even within sales, it must be a you know, quantity of sales or value of sales. As in, when I say value, I'm talking about the quality of the sale. Um, and then what other aspects would you suggest are, are key things that people could focus on as far as metrics? So the answer to that is that your scorecards for your business, which you should have multiple, have a cascading effect. So as a business owner, there's three things you're always looking at. There's going to be your revenue, your gross margin, and your and your net profit. Those three numbers are the, the the golden keys, right? Yeah. Within those three numbers, then you have your department numbers and you have your individual scorecards for each of the people because it's very important that you're driving people to, to your point mm. with the numbers that are going to make sense for their specific job, right? Yeah. Like someone in customer service, you know, has different numbers than a person in sales, has a different number of a person in IT. And you have to know all those individual numbers, especially as you grow. And when you're talking about a hundred million, a billion dollar company, you definitely have a lot of scorecards that that flow up. But mm -hmm. to me, those three numbers are the biggest, right? So I always start as a new business, you got to have an, an eye on sales, you got to have an eye on your gross margin, and you got to have an eye on your net profit. Um, and that'll help you. It's actually funny, the story you were saying, because I, I, I had someone um, back about four or five years ago that had a business and they ended up losing one of their biggest clients. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it resulted in like a 25 or 30 percent um, hit to their top line revenue. Right. Yeah. So they came in to the group. It was one of one of my business members. They came into the group and they were they were frantic. It's like, how am I going to overcome this? How am I overcome this? And then when we dissected that story or when we dissected that, that 30 percent and we said, OK, well, that 30 percent is costing you how much? And then mm -hmm. what are the expenses on that? And when we came down to it, the 30% the, the in revenue was only affecting like 10, excuse me, 10% of her net profit. Yeah. So the idea wasn't so much replace the 30%. It's like, how do you replace that 10% of net profit? Because yeah. honestly, that business could have been 30% of your revenue, but they weren't really that profitable. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really important story because I've heard that so much and I've dealt with that so much with um, certainly some of my clients where they went from 15 million to 10 million. And it was a choice where they were working flat out, uh, three guys running a plumbing business, 15 million turnover. Um, and they made a choice that they were going to get rid of the crap clients that they had. Yeah. And, and that resulted in their turnover dropping by a third. Um, but their profitability went up and they went from working seven days to working five days. Um, so they had more money at the end of the bank. So that's, I think, where you're saying the, the numbers to pay attention is not just sales, but your gross margin and your profit is really important. But would you do you break that down into like the different customers as to how profitable each customer is as well? Yeah, I've done it before. I, you know, in my in the IT business, we definitely do that. Um, yeah. So we actually know how profitable each customer is. Every time I do an acquisition. Um, that's the first metric. Once I actually acquire the company, I'll go mm. through the books and I'll say by customer. And then exactly like you said, it's like, oh, this guy's not profitable. We send them a letter. It's like, here's your increase. Um, if you don't like it, this is our 30 day notice. Right. Yeah. So we're a little more eloquent to it. But that's pretty much the idea. You, you take all these low uh, hanging fruits of people that are losing you money. You take them off the books. That business becomes profitable all of a sudden. Right. And yeah. then you absorb it into your company. Um, but like my wife's business, you can't do that because she's more of a B2C. Uh, yeah. So seeing one client to the other. So the way we act, we break up her stuff is different revenue streams. So she's got a couple categories of different things, different services that she ha offers, which one's more profitable. And mm. based on which one is more profitable, that's who gets more marketing dollars, right? So yeah. there's, there's a bunch of stuff like that that we do. Yeah. And from that perspective too, is it a case where you look at – because Profit is one thing, and that seems to be well. Not sorry, profit. Sales is one thing where, and that seems to be the glossy thing that we look at. And of course, it's always important to generate new sales. But every dollar you save at the bottom line, 
um, it, well, every dollar you save on expenses actually goes straight to your bottom line. So that increases your profit immediately, whereas increasing your sales still has the expenses to come off. So it's not the same ratio. Is that something that you you teach people to to think about and something you think about as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I'll even go even deeper on that because, you know, sometimes um, hitting the um, profit at the bottom isn't the most important thing. I've, I've done like um, employee engagement. Is, is one of the one of the yeah. ones that I like to pull out like measure employee engagement. Today. Get, yeah yeah but get that number up and see what the, what happens to your bottom line because mm. a lot of times if you if you take an expense off the books that is meant to keep your people happy or is to, meant to incentivize your people um, and you end up saving a couple dollars and you add it to the bottom line you've accomplished your goal but I bet you that you're gonna suffer in the near future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because there are three areas I, when working with my clients, is to focus on as far as setting goals. Is one is sales or financial goals, which includes you know your net profit, that kind of thing. The other one is operations, so how your operations work. And the third area to set goals is culture, because like you say, if you've got a good culture, you're attracting the right people. And in today's market too, where there is a, it's a skill shortage. It's um, you need to be really focused on being an employer of choice. Uh, is there any tips that you've got from that perspective of how you keep your employees happy? And it's not, I mean, from my experience, it's not just having a coffee machine. There's, there's, yeah. there's a, a way of creating a culture that that makes a difference. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the biggest thing that I've learned is employees want FaceTime um, and not not once a year. What's my review with a silly little piece of paper that you go through 10 questions and it's like, here's your 3% raise, right? They want <laughs> FaceTime to actually say, this is the things that I think are working for the company. And these are the things that I suggest we do for the company. And if you allow them to speak up and you allow them to give their opinions, they come up with some really great things. I mean, the other side of it is then rewarding them for the things they do. And with, with a non um, office centered company, it's, it becomes a little trickier, right? It's, it was a lot easier to keep culture when you were all in the same office. Yeah. It's a lot harder when you have everybody. I've got a guy working in North Carolina. I've got another guy working in New Jersey, one guy in New York, one guy in Florida. So I've got them all over the place. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, the important thing is that I give them some FaceTime and that, that we, we share some time together. We talk. Um, the other big thing that I've learned, um, and I actually put this on, on each employee's scorecard, is employees want to learn. You oh, have got to make it part of your culture to have a learning environment. I pay for three things every year for every single employee, and they get to pick what those things are. So my tech will come to me and says, I want this certification. Great, let's do it. I will pay for it. You yeah. know, my marketing lady wants to learn about SEO. Great, let's do it. And, you know, a lot of business owners say, well, why would you do that? Because they're going to get that stuff and then leave you. You know, and my my business coach always says to me, "Well, what happens if they don't learn anything new and stay?" Well, there's that component too. What if and what if they get disenfranchised and leave anyway? That's right. That's right. So I'm a big proponent in education, and and you know that that's also you know in my book you'll see that there's there's a there's a wheel called continuous learning. But I bring that not only to you my personal life, but also to my employees, especially with this generation which has been used to Google and information being at their fingertips. They are dying to learn new things and you just have yeah. to make that easy for them. It's interesting what you're saying about that, um, giving them FaceTime and it's not about once a year, it's that con that constant FaceTime um, or maybe constant is not the right word, but regular FaceTime might be yeah, regular. And because I've noticed that similar sort of thing, I have a program called um, Exceptional Effort and part of that, one of those modules is a continuous improvement and giving the people the ability to express it's it's a you just mentioned about how much knowledge they have and how much they want to share and how many ways to improve the business that they will share if you give them the opportunity which again like you say creating that culture to which has a continuous improvement i notice with a lot of bigger companies they will spend a lot of money on um, engaging a an external consultant um, to come in and give them advice on how to improve but that consultant hasn't been in in your your business business and doesn't understand what's going on and then the employees are going what the hell but you you how do you create that that face time with them especially in this environment because it is so crucial I, I know from my experience how much of a difference it makes it stops complaints 
It's amazing how much, I don't don't know if that's your experience or not, but giving them that face time and listening to them actually stops a lot of complaints within the business. How do you do do that? I mean, it it has to be embedded in your culture. Like it it is impossible for me to give all my employees face time. It just, it Mm. can't happen. I don't have the physical um, time. Um, But um, when it comes to making sure that my VPs are doing that with the directors and the directors are doing that with their employees and making sure that that's happening. And that's mm-hmm. how you end up doing it is you multiply yourself with, with your staff. Yeah. you got to start with early on, um, mm-hmm. when, uh, when your business is first starting and then just make sure that you keep doing that, uh, when you have other employees that can take care of it for you. Beautiful. You mentioned your book, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. So I, I haven't, um, for the listeners, the, it's got a wonderful book, and we'll talk about that. But I wanted to come back to this management of risk. And you mentioned before side hustle. I'm going to, and, and it's funny, I, I quote a lot of movies and TV, but I actually don't watch that much movie and TVs. But I, I remember the, there was a show called The Practice. And within yeah, that show, it. when that, yeah, and near the end, they introduced a couple of key characters to test the market, to test whether it worked. And then that then evolved into Boston Legal. Um, and that that was kind of, in a way, a side hustle, but also managing that risk of stepping out. And a lot of companies will do that. How do you, how would you suggest going through that process? Because you talked about starting a side hustle. So it might be a case of a person's, you know, an employee. I mean, you you worked as an employee for a long time. And, and I can imagine as much as you said, you know, when you were younger, you didn't want to get into business. There's part of you that was... It, it was playing in the back of your mind. I can I could hear yeah. that. In, in, in Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like it was playing in the back of your mind for a long time. And then it must have started to take more form. How, talk us through that process of how you went through and, and prepared that, but also to how someone could do that from the perspective of going, okay, I'm an employee. Because I would imagine as an employee, you would see lots of opportunity. When I'm saying opportunity, that's problems. Problem is an opportunity which you can then market, sell, and become a business generally. Um, mm-hmm. Talk us through your process through that and how someone could create a side hustle as an employee to take that step. And then we'll get into the part of when you're in a business, how to find those side hustles to expand your business. So usually when when you have someone that, that has a side hustle, it's because it's something that they are they have a job and, and the job pays their bills, but there's something that they enjoy doing that on the side is not really making it's actually probably a cost center for them personally but has the potential of being monetized right because one of the things i tell everybody is like if you're going to start a business make sure you have a passion in that business because if you're starting a business to make money forget it just stay an employee don't do it it's just it's going to be a waste of time if you start a business because you truly enjoy whatever it is that you're doing Mm -hmm. then you've got a winner right because the amount that goes back to the grit, it goes back to the passion, it goes back to having to build a business is really hard. So yeah. I love tech. I've always loved tech. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's real easy. I also like talking to business owners, right? And understand that, you know, I have my MBA, I can talk financials, I can talk business uh, with, with other professionals. So I put those two things together and I was able to build a business because I can translate technology to people that aren't don't have a tactical acumen and then have a good conversation with them about what they need in order to put it in their business. Um, and if you have something like that, that's how you start the side hustle. So the mm. side hustle is usually something and, and Etsy and all these uh, um, um, companies that, that that are out there are actually trying to monetize that in, in a platform, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of people that do stuff on yeah. the side, whether that's cupcakes or or build a computer or 3D printing something or, you know, building cars, whatever it is that they just do because they love it. And mm. that's really what you need to find. If you don't have that, I think it's really risky. That's one of the things that I would say, if you don't have that, you are, you are going to probably have a hard time bringing it to market and being successful. Right. So with bringing it to market... Um, with that side hustle, because the side hustle gives you the opportunity to manage risk. You can actually run longer. If you're putting everything, all your apples in that basket, you've actually got to make a return. Like you say, it could take a while and you might run out of capital very quickly. But having a side hustle, working out what your minimum is, was we talked about before, maintaining employee and starting that side hustle. From a marketing perspective, um, and you know, as, as we know, well, 
I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with this, that the most economical form of marketing is word of mouth. It just it doesn't really cost you anything. Yep. How do you how does someone with a side hustle manage that from the perspective? What what would be some of the tips that you would say to manage this um marketing side of things of creating that word of mouth, creating that buzz about what you're talking about? Because like you say, there's all these little platforms, but when you go to one of those platforms, there's a million people on there all trying to grab attention. And what would be some keys that you would say that can grab attention and give you that word of mouth as opposed to putting something into you know a platform that you're going to have to pay for anyway and it's going to be a cost? Yeah, I mean that's 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 a great uh, that's a great question because the, the reality is that it's 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 a multitude of things that you can do, right? It's not one thing. The the the, the thing that I start um, the people I mentor with is start your side hustle, put something on paper. And then go out, and even if you're not going to take the money, but go out and try to get investors for your idea, yeah. um, because you don't ne- you don't have to take the money. And a lot of times, I've, I've I've told we've had you know people that 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 have been offered the money is like don't don't take it, you know, just go go bootstrap this thing, you can make it. But the idea is, if you're able to convince someone yeah. to give you money, mm. you probably have a pretty good idea. So that's a. In the meantime. You're actually talking to people. You're out there. You're yeah. you're you're starting to make a little bit of buzz. The other side of it, and what we did with my wife's company, is um, using influencers in this day and age mm-hmm. is a really really easy good idea. And a lot of influencers will give you that marketing bang yeah. um, for very little, right? Yeah. So what we were doing for my wife doesn't it has an events company. So we were giving the influencers um, free events. Yeah. in their homes, right? And then we were getting pictures, we we're getting posts, we we're getting that. Um, and it cost us nothing, right? Maybe yeah. a couple dollars for the materials necessary. But besides that, it cost us nothing. So influencers is a great idea. Um, having a fantastic website, that's definitely something that you need to have this day and age without a website, you're pretty much dead. Yeah. Um, especially, even if uh, I see so many people go out there on social media, and they have the social media page. And it's like, there's no website on the other side of it. It's like, man, I, I get it that you have no money, but that website's so important, right? Yeah. Because without that, you don't have a real digital footprint. You could have a Facebook page, but that that's not the same. It's like standing on the street in the old school days. Sorry, sorry. I was going to say it's like standing on the street in the old school days with a with a um with a cardboard sign that you've handwritten on, and then telling people about this shop that you don't have because yeah. you don't have a physical presence. Well, you need the website today. It, it's a must, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and websites are not that expensive. I mean, Mm. the reality of it is with these things like Wix and Squarespace, it's not that hard to put a website up, right? Even yourself. Um, Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you need a real life website with real SEO and with real. uh, But by that time, I'm hoping you have money to be able to spend on a a website. Um, So that's the kind of thing that can do. Your foundation as well. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but that's that's what I would tell you. It's like I, I think a stirring a buzz is the big thing. Um, like I said, if you could convince someone to pay for your idea, whatever it's going to be, then you probably got a good idea. And then from there, you know, you just got to hustle, man. There's a, there's a, a thing between sales and marketing that that I, I think as the company hits different stages, sales and marketing kind of flip flop. Um, so when you first start a company, it's all about sales. Yeah. I, I mean, marketing is non-existent, but most people don't have money for marketing. It's really hard uh, to 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 get any kind of value from the amount of marketing you're able to afford. So it's got to be all about sales. Yeah. Once you get past that point and you get into a real company and you, you get to a, a certain size, I would say once you pass that million dollar mark, Marketing shifts with sales. It's all about marketing because if you don't have that presence out there, it's really hard for the sales to actually flow. You're not going to get any lead generation. Uh, so, but at that point, when it flips, then you start having money to be able to f- focus on different marketing channels. Yeah. Can you describe for because I think there's a lot of confusion out there being the difference between sales and marketing. Uh, can you describe the two, if you in a nutshell, what well, what is sales and, and what is marketing? Yeah, I, I anything that you do to generate leads into your business is considered marketing. And leads are just people that show an interest to your product or service, just yeah. an interest. That is marketing. Sales is when you take those leads and you start cultivating them and you put them through a funnel, right? Yeah. So they come in at the top of the funnel and you start 
qualifying the lead? Do they have the money for your service? Do they have the, the, the need? Do they have the pain points? And you have a conversation with them. You show them a proposal. All that is sales. Beautiful. Love that. Now, when doing this, you've, um, you mentioned about liking what you do. So let's take that as a foundation of liking what you, you, you've got that as your foundation. You like what you do. You're, you're an IT guy. You like working in IT. Um, that's a passion. Now, when you have to work hard at that and you have to struggle and you have to slog, that love for what you're doing can take a battering. How do you maintain that love and, and that motivation in those times? What do you do? to keep motivated, to keep enjoying what you're doing? Do you focus on the end goal? Do you focus on, do I, you know, I'm enjoying what I'm doing because I can see an end goal? How do you keep yourself motivated? I'm, I'm getting to the more the chemical things that happen in your body with, you know, dopamine and serotonin yeah. production because that's what makes us feel happy. How do you make yourself happy every day? It, it's kind of funny because that, that's that's really about that one win, right? Because yeah. um, in my, in my uh, specific technology, right, um, I love helping owners fix hmm. business problems with technology, right? Yep. And when you get that opportunity and you get that one win, you can have a whole bunch of other failures behind there that doesn't really affect you. And it's similar to customer service, right? Customer service, there's a little, there's a little needle. And every time you do something right, it goes up one notch, up one notch, up one notch, but do one thing wrong and it goes all the way down to zero, right? <laughs> yeah, it snakes and, <laughs> and lettuce. It's the same thing. Like, you're absolutely right. You do take a battery, but it's about that that win. I think for me, it's like when I go in there and I automate a process and the, the, the owner gets the benefit of it and he's super happy, that makes up for every other one where, you know, I get a no on a proposal or, uh, you know, you don't get a chance to sell or, or, or whatever the, the downfall could be. So from your perspective, you're saying that the motivation is is about and what keeps you going is focusing on that outcome, that that outcome is going to happen uh, as a mindset as yep. opposed to going, you know, oh, I'm hitting all these walls. Yeah. I, I mean, and there's been times where you, you, you kind of, I mean, and that's part, again, going back to the grit, there's been times where you sit there at the edge of your bed. It's like, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. And <laughs> it's because going back to the, the chemistry thing, it, it does take a beating on you. But then you just get up and you try one more time. And mm -hmm. that one more time just happens to take you out of it because it's like that's the one you close that deal. You do that cool thing or whatever it ends up being. You get this really great client um, and you just succeed and you keep going. And that's that's just life. You know, that's not that's not just business. That's just life. It's like I think if you just get up that one more time, it, you're mm -hmm. going to have some sort of success. And that's just going to take you out of the, 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 the little depressive cycle that you're in. And is part of that, this risk management we were talking about before and the, the side hustle type thing where you know you haven't put everything on the line? Because as you said, I, I can imagine now, like if you take your experience where you, know, where you put everything on the line, you've sold your house, the money's running out. And as you said, you're in a meeting and, and with people and, and you're literally crying because you're not sure what to do and how to, to do that. Whereas I can imagine now where you've got several businesses, if you start a new business and it's not going so well, that doesn't have as much pressure on you and it doesn't cause you to to be um, focused because, as you know, when, our, when we get stressed, we, we tend to have a, a narrow band of focus. Is that part of, you know, should someone think about that as well as far as managing risk as to going, okay, the downtime, if, if I'm not um, in this high stress situation, I'm going to perform better. I'm, I'm putting it in context, like a friend and I, we purchased an 1800 um, square meter. I'm not sure how to convert that to feet, sorry. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> there's only a couple of places in the world that still use the imperial system. Yeah. But anyway, we bought this factory um, and we but we had a plan to build a, a car track in it, a radio control car track, run it as a business, but we we had the underlying asset and we had you know, optimism bias. We're going to have all these people come and, and it was, but it never turned out that way. Um, it mm -hmm. was fantastic. It was ranked third best track in the world for, you know, for toy car track. That's pretty cool. Uh -huh. but, That's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, but I can look back at it and go, well, you know, it wasn't. For me, it wasn't a stress because we had we had the property. Yes, there was a mortgage for the property, but had other businesses that could manage that. I was having yeah. fun doing it. It wasn't a stress. I could still maintain having fun doing it, even though it wasn't making money. And because I owned 
the underlying asset. When we eventually, we had a number of things happen. My business partner got very serious cancer and had to have operate. A number of things caused, there were so many different stresses, like you say, in a business. And, and at the end, we decided to, to close it down um, because yeah. we just had other things we were doing. We sold it. And because we owned the property, we got all our money back anyway. Um, and and time money too, like all the time we put into it, when he converted that to dollars, we got all that back. Mm -hmm. um, and that was why, in my mind, I wasn't able, I wasn't as stressed about it, and and I, I could actually just keep doing it and enjoying it. Is that something that someone should consider as well? Putting themselves in a situation where they're not creating too much stress for a word is going to be really, really difficult to to move forward. And and how can you be, I would say, emotionally in a perspective where you can actually make that decision. It's, it's tough Damon, because I, I mean, when you start a business, it's like, it's like a baby, right? So it's really <laughs> hard to let go of it. I mean, yeah. I get what you're saying and minimizing your risk, but I'm sure that the fact that it didn't work out still bugs you, you know, it might not As be a 2 that 2.0 plan. Idea. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There you go. Which by the way, that's a fantastic idea. Um, but I mean, the way the way I look at it, and, and the thing that 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 has has taught me to to keep myself at peace is that I really do believe that life has a plan for everybody, mm -hmm. and as long as you're following the river of life and not trying to swim against the current, you're gonna get to where you're supposed to be anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, and sometimes that includes you know shutting it down and saying, well, you know that didn't work out. Let's go on mm -hmm. to the next thing and being okay with it. Yeah. Uh, because maybe that's not what you're meant to do, but I am positive that there's something way better, you know, next or way better in the future. So yeah. I, it's a matter of managing the stress internally more than externally. Cause sometimes that risk is so big mm. that if you allow yourself to get stressed out, you're going to be, you're going to fail just because you're stressing yourself out. So it's yeah. about managing that stress more than anything else. Yeah. And how do you make that assessment? Because you you talked about shutting it down. I mean, have you been through that experience? Like for one, a, a, a different business that I started, um, I put a lot of effort into getting it all set up. I, the branding was all, it was, it was really schmick and people loved it. And the timing in the market was wrong. Well, I'm, and I made a couple of mistakes at the start as well because I was stepping into a new area. Um, so that didn't help the start, but we made those adjustments. And But then the market the economy, those kind of things hit really hard out of left field. I thought we we're coming out of you know a, a recessive period and we started moving up, but then all of a sudden it actually dipped down again and, and caught me off guard. And I looked at it and I went, okay, we're, um, we're not getting any growth at all as far as sales go. And that means, you know, I'm going to carry these losses. And I projected that forward and said, well, if this continues, this is what that's going to add up to. And I said, I'm not willing to do that. And I'd invested, you know, it wasn't a lot. Well, I say it's relative, but it was a hundred grand that I'd put into this, this business to get it up and running. And I said, okay, I'm pulling the pin. And literally two weeks later, I, I'd made a decision, put everything in place. Two weeks later, I just shut it down and said, no. And I kept the IP, but like you say, that opportunity came up later where I could actually relaunch it. I've always got two point eyes planned when something doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this opportunity just came out of left field, but because I had all that IP there, I was able to relaunch it and and it worked very, very well. And how do you have you had that experience where you've had to shut something down and, and how do you make that decision how do you decide on, okay i need to to cut my losses it's not a failure i've learned i need to cut the losses because i need to protect myself um mm -hmm. and that there is something that will potentially come up in the future how do you how do you do that yeah i, I mean it's, it's a fantastic point and you kind of answered the, the the question yourself it's all about taking the emotions out of it yeah. and having a clear decision whether that's in the future or not you're saying this is my decision point and mm. I'm going to stick to it, yeah. unemotional, completely unemotional. And you say, I'm willing to risk X amount of dollars. And if I lose that X amount of dollars, I lose that X amount of time, but that's it. I'm done. Um, when you get closer, you know, there's going to be a period where you start reevaluating or start. But like you said, two weeks later, you shut it all down because things may have gone a little worse, a lot faster or whatever it is. But, you know, to me, it's really about taking that emotion out of it and just mm. being a good businessman. Um, there is plenty of indicators. I had a business where we didn't invest that much, not nearly a hundred thousand dollars, but a, a couple of young kids that, that wanted to do a, um, 
they were doing uh, 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 events uh, like festivals and things. Um, and we invested in it and we gave them the money that they requested to start the business. And they started the business and the business failed within, I think it was six months where they just ran out of money and they couldn't make it work. Um, but we were okay with it because our decision was to put them out X amount of dollars in there. You know, we weren't going to reinvest in the company. Um, there is times where you have to kind of think about whether or not realistically reinvesting is actually going to make the company succeed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's happened as well, where we reinvested some more money, but there was there was indicating factors that led us to believe that that reinvestment is going to make it work. Right. Uh, to your point with the with the one that you did. You saw that it wasn't working the way it was. You decided to shut it down, but you had the IP and you just waited for the opportunity to come around. Um, that's that's a, a perfect businessman experience because you've done it before. You know exactly what you're doing. You've held on to the, the – you shut it down enough to where it stopped the bleeding, but you didn't lose the IP. I think that's a fantastic decision. Yeah, and how do you do that? How do you keep that emotion out of it? I mean, I – I mean, I've been accused of being a robot at times. So I'm going to be honest, <laughs> past girlfriends, um, <laughs> and it's like, but I, I'm quite comfortable, you know, treating it as disassociating. Going, you know, as much as I love this, because and this is your baby, as you mentioned before, business is like a baby. How do you, how do you disassociate? What do you do to, to disassociate? Because I've seen people just keep putting money into something, getting into mm -hmm. more and more debt. Um, yeah. and, and then all of a sudden it still doesn't work and all they're left, they have to shut it down anyway. And, and they're just left with a whole bunch of debt. How do you take that emotion out of it? Yeah. I, I mean, and, and that's people that are going to make it as compared to people that aren't going to make it. I mean, the way I do it, and there's a multitude of way to do it. You know, people can use the gym and working out. I use meditation. That's my, yeah. my biggest thing. Um, I try not to make, um, because uh, from a personal level, you know, I see a car I like, I'll buy it. I just, I'm <laughs> like that kind of emotional guy, right? Like that, that's really hot. I'm getting that, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But from oh, a business yeah. sense, I, I really try not to be spontaneous in my decision. Mm -hmm. um, again, when I was younger, mm -hmm. way different than now. Yeah. When I was younger, it was all, let's just go, go, go. Now it's more like, well, let me give it 24 hours. Let's Let's see how I feel tomorrow. Uh, that's but that's how I kind of do it is just let, give yourself time and then just try to play and, and removing your emotions is a skill. It's something that you could definitely learn. Is that something, because I remember a story of Abraham Lincoln after he, was it Abraham Lincoln? One of the, the presidents in America anyway, after he died, um, they found in his drawer some letters that he'd written. Um, it was to do with it was the Civil War. I'm so I'm not from America, so I apologize yeah, yeah. For, for messing up your history. And I know that's very important. Um, yeah, it, but, I mean, Civil War could be Abraham, so absolutely. Yeah, so I think it was Abraham Lincoln where and and there was some things that hadn't happened on the front that he expected and hadn't made the push that they needed, and, and they could have actually won the war a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And and it, there was a they, they found this letter in his desk that's yeah, you know was scathing and why haven't you pushed forward why haven't you done this you know and and he never sent it <clears throat> and you mentioned about waiting 24 hours yeah. and i wonder is that you know just a maturity thing of going okay let's just give it that time to settle because we've all done that we've had an emotion and said something we wish we didn't whether it's in a personal relationship or whatever if we had to just bit our tongue or just thought about it for a little bit more before making that decision is that critical to this this taking the emotion out of it Oh, absolutely. It, it's a critical life skill. Yeah. I, I mean, I would challenge anybody that that's that's like even surfing the internet to buy something, right? Fill the cart and then come back 24 hours later and see if you actually buy it. Uh, <laughs> it because it, it, it really like time does make a big difference. All of a sudden, yeah. what was all necessary five minutes ago, you know, you give it enough time and it's like, you know, I don't need that. And you kind of walk away from it. So yeah, it's absolutely a life skill if, as far as I'm concerned. Even if you're talking mm -hmm. about you know, punishing your kids or um, uh, giving them a gift or whatever it could be. If you just give it a little more time, if you come back to something and you do it, your decision was probably the right one. Yeah, that's a great, great piece of advice. All right, coming back to your book, and I wanted to get to this book, and I, I left it. Yeah, you know, now you're running a business, you've set up business, you've, you know, which is flat out, and you've talked about that process of how difficult that was. You're also ma managing a number of other businesses as well, yet you've still had time to write a book. How did you, you know, where did the idea for the book come from, and then how did you find the time to write the book? <laughs> 
So for anybody that hasn't written a book, um, it, it it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Um, it took me three years to write a book. I've attempted to write a book uh, three other times before this one. Um, mm-hmm. And each time that I've tried to sit down and write a book, it, it didn't go well. But it did take me three years to write it. Um, wh- what happened was, and and um, it was, so there was a point in my life when I started these businesses where I had um, time on my hands. And what, not so much time like I, I, I could say that free time, right? Because yeah. you can always be doing something when you're starting a business. But there was time on my hands. And I remember sitting in my office, um, in my home office. And coming to an epiphany where I said to myself, my God, I am an avid reader. I've read no less than 350 books in my life. I've listened Mm. to all these podcasts. I'm part of Vistage. Like I've amassed an an amazing amount of knowledge. Mm. And I'm 40. I was 44 at the time. I'm 44 years old. And I started thinking about my children. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, if they have to go on a similar path, it's going to take them about 40 years to get to where I am today. There's got to be a way for me to fast track this. Yeah. And that's when I sat down and I don't know where it came from. Damon. I just started drawing out the four wheels and the six pillars. Um, and they're just categories to the things that I learned that you need in your life to actually access that person that's inside of you. That person that you go to a meeting one day and you just knock it out of the park and you're like the best version of yourself and you're at all with yourself like who was that like who was that person that showed up today right why am i not that person every single day so i drew this thing out and it ended up being um a graph of the four wheels and the six pillars and then from there i put together a a uh, um a framework of what i thought the book would be um and then i would devote a couple hours here a couple hours there and would write a little bit then go back and write a little more and three years later, I actually came out with a book. <laughs> so was you? did you actually have yourself set a goal where you're going to say, I'm finished this book by now, or you, you just let it flow and finished whenever it finished? No, I, it was completely unrealistic for me to have a goal uh, because, like you said, I had so many things going on. There was, there was weeks where I didn't touch it. Uh, and yeah. I just I let it go. And that was really hard because if you uh, again, once you've written a book, you know that it's all about the the, the train of thought. Right. So mm-hmm. as you're sitting there writing and there's a, there's a train of thought that goes through, but there's also an amount of energy you have to actually sit there and, and write it into words. Right. Yeah. So those two things go hand in hand. So you can sit there and write for an hour, two hours, and then you're burnt. Yeah. Right. Because don't forget, you just work the entire day, too. Um, <laughs> and then you come back when you make it like four weeks and you try to pick up from where you left off, it's really hard. You have to go back and start reading everything you wrote in order to get back on that train of thought. So it, it's very difficult. I would say if you ha- want to write a book, I would tell you that the outline was really helpful to me That yeah. because I could you could sit down and write an outline for a book in an hour, yeah. right? So if it's, especially if it's something that you're very, very learned about. And that helped me stay within the framework so that this way I could pick up chapter one and I knew exactly where I was and and and, and then pick it up from the last time. Um, but giving myself an, a deadline, absolutely impossible. Yeah. And the four wheels. Now, you mentioned before you're a bit of a car guy. You see a car that you like and you go and buy it. Is, is Was that part of the reason why you, you selected four wheels or was there another motivation? For yeah. It? So, uh, I, and again, I don't know where the idea came from. It, it, it was almost... Uh, um, uh, I don't know, divine inf- intervention, but yes, I'm a car guy. So I, in my head, I got this picture of this amazing car and like all four wheels smoking. And that's when you actually <laughs> get true potential, right? <laughs> so, um, but the idea is that um, I, th- I see it as you have to get these four wheels spinning mm-hmm. and each wheel helps the other one spin. Um, yeah. And as you get them spinning, once you get all four of them spinning, you actually have access to your true potential. And then once you get each one spinning faster, you become more of your true potential. Because mm-hmm. and part of the book, it actually says is like, I don't believe that there's a limit as to what you're capable of. It's just yeah. a matter of getting yourself to that level and then seeing how more you could push. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I've actually tested it out myself because, I mean, I'm pretty successful. But I keep pushing forward, and I want to see how much more do I have in me. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, the, as for the the four wheels that make it up, because uh, uh-huh. you've got you've got the health wheel, clarity, peace, and power. Was there? I mean, do you 
treat them as those are the the key fundamentals or there's other aspects that should be or or these are the key things that you really need to focus on and what would be that we if we go through each of them what would be some of the more uncommon reasons for having that as a priority i mean health is when you say health i mean it's obviously going to look after your health but what would be something more uncommon that makes health more of a priority in your out of all the things that could be of the four wheels why is what is health there for so the, the the way I I designed or the way I th- I think about it is you you have the four wheels you have health clarity peace and power and there's six pillars mm-hmm. um two pillars support the health wheel and that's fitness mm-hmm. and nutrition yeah. so in order to be healthy to to have your body and healthy and I'm not talking about being a bodybuilder or being like super muscular that that's not the intent here right the intent mm-hmm. is that you need to put good food in your body because I believe that food is medicine. Yeah. And a lot of times people don't understand that. You could actually be poisoning yourself with the things you're throwing in your body. Yeah. And then fitness, it's a matter of just keeping moving. You don't have to do much to be actually fit, right? A yeah. little bit of cardio, walking around, going to going walk with your wife uh, or, or your husband, with your kids on the bike. You know, that's enough to just keep you uh, in a fitness. But that will get your health wheel spinning. Your health wheel will prevent you from being sick. I mean, yeah. I don't know the last time that I, I've gotten a cold, I yeah. mean, honestly, right? Um, so you can actually make your body stronger with that health. Then you have clarity. Clarity has one pillar. It's called effective routines. And that's yeah. all around your sleep needs, your bedtime routine, your wake-up routines, all the things that I have learned need to be part of your life in order to uh, get that clarity wheel spinning, right? And that will keep your mind clear because when you have a clear mind, you're that more effective. Mm-hmm. Then you go to peace. Peace is about your heart, right? And it has two pillars. One is relationships and yeah. the other one's about spiritual mental health. Mm. Both those components are really important to have peace in your heart. If you're always constantly fighting with your spouse or you have people in your life that are negative influence, you're never going to be peaceful, right? Yeah. Um, if your mental health is not there, right, there's serious mental health issues out there. So if you have a problem with depression, I've had a problem with depression in my life. Mm. I know what it's like not being able to kick yourself out of it, right? Yeah. Um, some people have anxiety. Anxiety is another thing. You know, if you have that, you can never be at peace. If you're not at peace, you will never be at your best. And mm. the last, my favorite is power, which is yeah. supported by continuous learning. Right. Yeah. And I give people this example all the time. You could have a computer that's 10 years old. But it has your accounting package in there and has your Excel and it has Microsoft Word. It has all these great programs in there, all this great information, right? And then you have this brand new computer and it has the most powerful processor and the most powerful hardware out there, but it has none of the programs. Yeah. It doesn't have your accounting package. It doesn't have your Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't have anything. Is this computer smarter? Yeah, it's smarter. But I'll take this one any day of the week because this one will get me what I need. It'll actually be able to do stuff. And that's why I tell people is that it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you mm. don't have that knowledge base and you don't constantly ingest brand new knowledge, you will never get to that true potential. And that's really where I believe your true potential starts becoming more and more and more because now mm. you got your health wheel spinning. You get your clarity wheel spinning. You get your peace wheel spinning. Now you got your power wheel. And now your power wheel is going to be something that you're going to keep ingesting information. Then that information will help you get your health wheel spinning faster, which will get your clarity wheel spinning faster. And all of a sudden, you're a totally different person. You're doing these great burnouts all over the place. That's right. <laughs> Four wheel burnouts, like all wheel drive burnouts. <laughs> I love that. And I, I really do. I mean, because that's, I, I love, you seem to have a different take on it with, with your book is, you know, it's. I really enjoyed reading, um, reading the, and understanding what you were talking about, particularly. And I, I love the part where you talk about effective routines. Mm-hmm. How important is that? You know, from the side of you know, creating that habit. And when we talk about you know habits, you know, depending on who you talk to, somewhere between eighteen and twenty-eight, or you know, repetitive times. Yep. You know, but how does someone you know, from the perspective of creating effective routines in their life? How do they recognize what's not working? And then how do you create that change so they can create those effective routines? Yeah, so a, a great question. So that goes back to continuous learning. There, there is a portion where you need to understand what you're doing. Like the worst thing anybody can do is say, I am going to start doing all these great things. Like January 1st, I'm changing my life. <laughs> No, don't do, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. You know, pick one thing that yeah. you're pretty much learned in. If you're not mm-hmm. learned in that subject, 
go pick up a book, go get it, read a podcast, go learn about it. And mm-hmm. then from there you could start doing it. But routines are so crucial. I mean, that's where you have your smart goals going back to your business, right? If you don't know how to build a smart goal, Go mm-hmm. learn how to build a smart goal because goals that don't have time, that don't have a date, that don't aren't measurable, those are not good goals. Because yeah. just saying you're going to do something, something in, sometime in the future, that's not a good goal. So learning how to do those things um, will help you in whatever you you, you want to get uh, accomplished in life. Um, and I tell people start with the easy stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Bucket list. Yeah. Everyone should have a bucket list and you should be looking at that every single, like I look at my bucket list every week. I said, yep, yeah. these are the things I want to do. And then when I accomplish something, I put three new things on that thing. You yeah. know, that's an easy, effective routine that you should have because most people go through life, work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, eat. And that's all they're doing in their life. You yeah. have to have things that, that like, I want to go on a cruise. I want to go see Italy. I want to yeah. buy this car, like have things like that in your life. How do you do? I mean, because Napoleon Hill talks about that from that perspective of you know have your have your list um, or what it is that you want to achieve, and then read it every day. <clears throat> Excuse yep. me, um, and and that's as you're talking about effective routines. Is that you know what what you would suggest for someone as a fundamental rather than you know going through life reading it you know. Because I know from my perspective, that's very much the case. Not not only I have my own personal mission statement, which I, I it's just so unconscious now. I don't even have to read it. It's just constantly there, and I can recite it. And I'm, I'm I'm acting from that. And what I'm getting to there is, we talk about. Um, well, I, I certainly talk about you know the difference between consciously knowing and unconsciously acting. Years ago, I used to read lots and lots of books, and I'm sure you relate to this. Me reading all these books, and then you look at it and you go. I've read all these books, but I haven't changed this a bit. I'm doing the same things I was always doing, um, which was my, well, that was my story anyway. And and then I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one book uh, and one part of that book, and I'm going to integrate that. So it's going to become an unconscious habit because I, ha- I have a military background. And, and part of that was you do drill, so it becomes an unconscious behavior. There's a cause, you react, and it, you just do it, like changing gears in a car, coming back to the car references. <laughs> it, it's not something you think about. How important is it to recognize from that those routines to actually go, okay, let's integrate this and make that happen rather than try and do everything all at once? Yeah, that, that's a that's a fantastic point. And I do talk about this in the book because um, the, the, in the beginning of the book, I tell everybody there, there's a couple of rules that the 80% rule, but one of the ones that, I, that, that that's also in there is all about starting slow mm. and then building as it becomes mm. a habit. Right. Yeah. So I used to be 350 pounds, uh, believe it or not. So wow. I was morbidly obese. Yeah. And I remember that I had a hard time just walking, right. Wow. Just walking would take a lot out of me. Um, and the way I got out of it is that one day I decided to do just that, just get up. And I would walk a little bit. Yeah. And then one day I just added a little more. Once it became easier for me to do that, I got out and I started walking around the block. Mm-hmm. And then we used to have this lake around the house and then it, it turned into a lake. And then eventually it turned into uh, a membership at uh, Tidal Boxing, right, where they do a lot of uh, cardiovascular workout. And then it turned into a full-fledged gym membership. And little by little by little, it was adding upon adding upon adding. So yeah. in the book, I talk about all the things that I believe should be part of your life. But nowhere do I say, do it now. Do it all now. You have mm-hmm. to make them routines. You have to make them habits. Mm-hmm. And and I do mean routine and then habit because there is a big difference between them. Once they become second nature, you add on and you do yeah. something else, right? Then maybe you add a sleep routine. Maybe you add a meditation routine, but there's all these great things and you just got to add them a little at a time as they become part of your life. Yeah. Is that because you know if you try and do everything all at once, you're spending too much effort in different areas and not really effectively doing anything? But if you do one thing, do that well, then move on to the next thing, you actually accomplish more over time. Is that what you're getting to? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I even go as far as to tell the 80% rule that I uh, talk about in the, in, in the book is all about giving any one thing at least 80% effort, right? You don't yeah. have to give it 100% effort mm. because even giving something 100% effort, yeah, you'll get to the finish line faster, but some people just get burnt out and then they mm. give up on whatever they're doing. So like, uh, nutrition is one of my favorite because obviously, you know, that's where I think everybody should start. But 
if you don't need a fad diet, you don't need a high uh, calorie restrictive diet to start losing weight. Just do nothing more than eat 80% of whatever it is. You like pizza? Mm. Great. You eat pizza every day? Great. Eat 80% of what you are doing. I guarantee you that you're going to start losing weight, right? You yeah. do things like that. Water. Drink 80% more water. It doesn't have to be 100% more water. Just 80% more and add mm. that to your life. And you start doing these little things and as they become habit, because at a certain point, drinking water just becomes part of your normal life, just like not drinking water is right now, right? Yes. Um, eating a little less becomes part of your life, just like eating all those calories is. But if you do those things and you just do 80% of it, you start seeing, you start getting traction. And then as you could do a little more, you add it. And then once you master that one thing, you add the next thing. Yeah. How important is it to, when you, you're doing that, when you're changing one habit to another habit, to actually having something more productive there or, or a different habit? From my experience, uh, I'm, I'm I'm still a big chocolate lover, but and and I'm a contracts guy. So I, when I you know I um I'd go I'm only going to eat the first row of the chocolate, um and then I'd take that first row and then I go well that now is the first row, so I'd have the next one <laughs> and soon the bar's gone. And so I just made it a habit of okay I'm not going to um not going to buy the chocolate, but then what I did was I replaced it in the sense of I had more fruit and to your point water and I made sure that I've got my filtered water jug sitting on the bench right there in front of me so I can see it and I go okay and that was how I was able to change that habit how important is it to change um you know to have something to change that habit too and and make that a focus yeah I mean it's it's definitely everybody learns differently uh, and, and you know creating habits is is just another form of learning right yeah. a, a lot of us actually know the right things to do and the wrong things to do you know a lot of us know a lot about nutrition and we know a lot about fitness we choose yeah. to ignore it but we know yes. it um so it, you know it's all about the way you are able to learn how to do things you know i'm an auditory learner so a lot of times you know podcast audio, audio books that's how i end up picking up things other people need to have that thing in front of them as a reminder which is fine if that's mm. the way you learn that's great let's let's do that put that big uh, container of water in front of you and just start knocking away at it um but it's it's a matter of knowing yourself you know and that's probably the biggest challenge that the young people have as compared to older people, older people know themselves. Yeah. They know how they have to treat themselves in order to get certain things done. Younger people have a harder time. They're still, you know, learning how to do those things. Uh, but do whatever it is that makes it easy for you mm -hmm. and just master one thing and then go on to the next one and then master that other thing and go on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice with that. If you're going to sum up the book, what, what would you say are the key takeaways from your book that people should integrate into their life? So the biggest thing about the book is really about that continuous learning. I, I mean, I, you know, that's why I, I, I talk about podcasts in, in, in the book. And I think podcasts are a phenomenal way to, to learn, especially these types of podcasts where we're sitting and having a conversation because mm. it's not necessarily that we agree with everything we're saying with each other right but there's this challenge there there's discussion mm. i mean that i think that that's a skill that the entire world needs to learn all over again because there's not <laughs> enough of that yes. uh, <laughs> uh, so let's just talk without getting upset at each other you know it's it's it, i know it's mind-boggling but um but yeah so i think continuous learning is the biggest thing to the book and mm. and, and that will help you get the other stuff yes i list out the other core principles but you have to learn before you can do any of the other things. Yeah, that's really important. Um, this continuous learning and how much of that comes down to actually wanting to listen? Because we, we talk about that where today's environment, it seems to be more, and, and I don't get involved in debates at all now because debates is two yeah. people with an idea turning up, trying to convince the other person and not listening to anything. How much do you feel how do we get to that mindset because i do think we've gone too far the other way i agree with you completely where we we actually need and that was my only resolution for this year because i was thinking about it coming into the new year going well my goals and, and my intentions are pretty set already that had been planned and i'm still working to that because they're, they're much bigger so i was like do i really have any new year's resolutions and it didn't feel right that i didn't have any and then was talking with someone we talked to and i'd been focusing for several years on listening because how often do we sit in a conversation and we're too busy thinking about what we're going to say next not really listening and i'd been training myself to really be actively listening and i said well that's actually going to be my i'm going to i'm going to master that was my thing it's like i'm good at it but let's be really really good at it and so i'm just wondering how much of that continuous learning process 
is about the listening, but how do we make that transition from where we are now, where it seems to be more about, you know, getting offended at something that someone said rather than understanding what was the underlying part about that? A fantastic question. I mean, the, 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 it goes back to everything we've been discussing. You're not the smartest person in the room. Yeah. Learn that, right? And then <laughs> accept that you may be wrong. Like, I, I actually like, uh, you know, listening to the opposing argument. I won't argue mm-hmm. with people anymore either. I'm, I'm right there with you. But mm-hmm. I will listen to what they have to say. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times they make me think, you know, do they change my mind? Sometimes. Most times, no. Most times, you know, I'm set in my ways and I, I do have, I'm very opinionated. But I do listen to people because sometimes it takes someone saying it a certain way to kind of make you say, huh. Well, I may not agree with it, but he's got a very good point. He or she has a very good point. So I, I think listening is super important. I don't think we're doing that. I see way too many people just screaming at each other uh, <laughs> and not getting anywhere. Um, and it's a, I don't know if it's a lost art or what. I mean, many, many of our politicians are, are, are they look like they listen, but they're not even paying attention. Uh, you know, so it's yeah. really, really important to sit there and just have the, patience to give someone the opportunity to state their point mm. in completion and then you can disagree with that person that i mean i'd be amazed it's impossible for all of us to agree on everything um but then you respect your point and you move on how much of that like as you mentioned even though that someone might not change your opinion but from your perspective when you've actually stopped and listened to them how, even though your your opinion stays the same have you learned from that and been able to integrate other things that have actually made you better? So even though, I mean, because we cannot, we all we don't all have to have that same opinion. If if we all had the same opinion, there'd be one type of phone in the world, and there wouldn't be this rivalry between you know iPhone and, and Samsung. <laughs> you know, and we wouldn't be, be better. Yeah. You know, um, but what I'm getting at is, you know, from that perspective, even though you have a difference of opinion, I find from my perspective this active listening i might go well actually i don't agree i understand you mentioned before understanding your point of view but from understanding the point of view i've gone well, actually there's part of that i can integrate and actually help me to even though my opinion hasn't changed it's helped me move forward and act in a better way yeah i mean there, there's multitude of, of of examples i could give them and be you know uh, yes the answer is yes i don't want to get into because a lot of this stuff it's really hard to 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 talk without having a a political skew or having my opinion come out right in a a certain way but yes there's definitely things even with uh, my daughter i i love my daughter my oldest daughter uh with all my heart i do not agree with her choice of of life i do not agree with a lot of things that, that 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 she does um but I love her. She's my daughter. And I'll sit there and listen to her anytime she wants. Mm. Um, we'll have political conversations and we're on two different spectrums. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's OK. Uh, at first, it was hard, mm. um, especially when it's that close to home. Yeah. Uh, it's something that I had a really hard time understanding, but I did grow from it. And I thank her for 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 I guess I thank her for the struggle. Mm. Uh, because struggle made me learn a lot and made me grow to the person I am today. So, uh, but there is definitely a multitude of things where I have learned and I have learned to respect other people's opinions and other people's way of mm. thinking. Um, but I still don't agree with her. Yeah. That's, and I wanted to get that. And I know that was difficult to come out because I went through a similar sort of thing where it was the same thing where people that had a difference of opinions, like, and then I went, hang on a minute. They're they're entitled to have a, their opinion as well, but what can I learn from that? And and the point, I love the words that you use there, but that's okay. And it is okay that people have differences of opinion. We don't have to be all the same. I, I, I mean, I personally, if there was a whole bunch of people like me in the world, that would be really bad. I think you know, <laughs> one of me is enough. <laughs> Yeah. So, but yeah, I no, love it, what you say. That's okay. Yeah. Um, and is that something we just need to get to and go? Well, it is okay to be different. We don't have to be the same, and and it's not a threat to us that someone is different. Yeah, I I, I think so. There, there there's a threshold, obviously, right? I yeah. mean, where that threshold because it's got to be like a huge gray area. There's 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 certain things that are clearly wrong or yeah. clearly. Can't just just you cannot accept it, right? Correct. Um, but there's a huge gray area, 
And that's yeah. where you kind of got to live and kind of understand where once they get into that gray area, it's okay. Um, you know, it's, it's your choice to, to be whatever way you want. Um, it's not easy. It's, it's yeah. definitely not easy. There's a lot of stuff I don't agree with, uh, you know, in today's world. Um, but as long as it doesn't cross that threshold to where you start affecting my ability to make my decisions, or you start mm. affecting my children, or you start affecting our yeah. lives, you know, at that point, do what you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody else. Yeah, and, and obviously we, we're taking it and we probably need to add that disclaimer in that we're not talking about someone doing something like, you know, Adolf Hitler did or, you know, that kind right, of thing. Right. We're, we're talking right. about, you know, when you look at it and go, well, you, you can have, it's not really affecting me or, or, or causing anyone harm to have that difference of opinion and, and that's okay. I, I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can, you can absolutely steal it. I mean, that's that's yeah. one of the things, man. You know, these podcasts that I've been doing, I've been doing podcasts now for, for the last two, three years, but it, it it's it's starting to stir up my, I, I've always wanted to have a political life after mm. after business right right um and it's for these reasons because i feel that i actually can sit here and listen and i mm. actually feel that i can hear anybody's point of view will i agree with everybody no absolutely not i mm. like i said I, i'll have my points of view and I'm, I'm pretty set in my ways but i would love to hear other people's point of view i you know i i listen to cnn just as much as i listen to fox news yeah. right just because i like that 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 contrast yeah. Yeah. And then that's what makes you stronger, I believe, from from my experience anyway. The fact when I – I used to be an arrogant F word um, when I was younger. <laughs> it was like I knew everything and I wasn't going to be told anything. But I, yeah. I've since found that you know, from listening and I said I, I discovered this a long time ago and it's been a progressive thing and this – yeah, it was became okay. This is something I'm really going to. That's going to be my focus to really, really listen to people, not necessarily agree with them, but to listen. Yeah. Um, and it just makes. I found it's made me so much stronger in the sense that I can calmly sit back and listen. If I need to act, I will act. If I need to explain something, I can explain something. Um, and if if that person, if we can't agree, then we, maybe we need to be separate. Um, <laughs> that's you know, yeah, uh, and. I was just was just wondering how is there you know is it a process of because these podcasts seem to be great getting a lot more um, popularity. There's a number of people that now actually do. You know, it's almost like a rock concert where they'll just have a, a discussion on mm -hmm. on a stage and people will be involved with that. Is that something that you think is the movement that we need to make where we we actually people will then start to realize okay, listening's just something that's really important. Yeah, I, I think social media needs to be completely. Um, redone. And I think these podcasts are one of the formats that will get more attention and will grow because look at the difference between Twitter and Facebook and all these other social media platforms as compared to a podcast. A podcast, yeah. they have intelligent people having conversations, they mm -hmm. let each other talk, and you actually get something out of them as compared to someone sitting there with a 24 carat tweet that, that it's insulting or um, gets banned or it gets taken down. And like, you don't have that with podcasts, you know, because people want to have conversations and there's plenty of podcasts where um, people have difference of opinion and they're having cordial discussions about it. Yeah. Um, and I think it's super, super important because I do understand the whole uh, philosophy of Twitter being like the next town hall. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I think it's a big, I think Elon is doing the best he can with what he, he was given. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I think that the, 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 the podcasts are, are a way better format. They're longer. People get to express their points a lot better. Um, there's none of this bullying that's happening with, uh, at least I haven't seen it with the podcast I listen to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's crucial. We need to talk. We're we're a conversive species, right? You know, it's one of those things that 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 we do is we sit there, we have thoughts in our heads, and we put them into words, and then the other person comes back with a different opinion or or yes, I agree. And 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 you know, I, I think that they're super important. And these conversations that we're having as well, because I, I always come back to, um, and I, I talk about the the movie Crocodile Dundee, and I don't know if you remember that movie or not, but there's, oh, yeah. a, scene, <laughs> there's a scene in it That's where they're a knife. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the other scene that I like from that movie is when they're in the high rise having a discussion and they're talking about a psychologist. And she says to him, 
you um you probably don't have a you psychologist in Walkabout Creek and he goes, No, no, we 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 just have Wally. If we have a problem, we tell Wally. Wally tells everybody else, no more problem. And how much of that <laughs> is, you know, today where we're going, we we get really worked up thinking that we've got this problem that we're all alone and, and maybe through the shortness of the tweets or you know, the Facebook posts or whatever, we're not really understanding that people are going through the same process. And by having that discussion, we actually realize that people are going through the same thing. I've been fortunate to travel to over 40 countries. I think I've traveled to 44 countries. Yeah. And in talking with the people that I've been there, I've, I've learned that that we're all rough. We all have the same fundamental wants and needs. We want to enjoy our life. We want good times with our family. Um, we want good things for our kids. I haven't met anybody that you know hasn't fallen in. I'm sure there's some sociopaths and psychopaths out there that don't fit that category. And but that would be the really, really end of the, you know, the curve. Majority of people just want that they all want that same thing. And is it a case where if we the having these discussions, we actually start to realize, hey, we, we've got a lot of things here that we do have that fundamentally we have the same things in common. And through our differences, we can actually learn how to make that happen as well. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that the 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 platforms um have their merits. Like it's really easy to be insincere in a tweet, you know, or a post, right? No. Because it's it's short and it's also really easy to get misunderstood in one of those. <laughs> it's a lot harder on a on a you know a venue like this because mm. you have to put your words together. The other person can challenge what you're saying, and mm. you're going to have to come back to it. So I, I think this format definitely leads itself to better um, sharing of ideas and better mm. communication of ideas and challenging of ideas than any one of those platforms. Yeah, beautiful. All right, let's come back to you know your business. Now you've spent a lot of time setting it up. You've got desk side, and I love that name. And and I you know there's just so many ways you can interpret that. And you know I have called it welcome to the desk side. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. it, is it was that intentional with the the name choice, or what, where did that start? And tell us about the the desk side business, what it does, how it helps people. Yeah, so so the name it's really funny because I, like, I have started a lot of businesses in my life, um, bo both as owner and, and, and other. But one of the things that um, will come up when you start your business is your URL for the domain. Yeah. yeah. And you have to throw some words out there and see if they stick, right? Yeah. <laughs> because it's really yeah. hard. You got to buy it, right? Yeah. So that side yeah. just makes sense because we are an IT company that uh, outsources. Um, your uh, IT departments from small, medium, and enterprise level businesses so that you don't have to hire your own staff. You could have a depth of knowledge because I have really, really great individuals that would be a little harder to get into one company, especially mm -hmm. if you're a small business. You're never going to get that level of, 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 of person in a small business. It's just that you're not going to be able to afford it, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, the name made a lot of sense. Um, it, we had the URL. Yes. Uh, and it's fun. You could do a whole bunch of different uh, things with it when it comes to marketing. Yeah. Uh, but we like to coin ourselves as your technology success partner. That it is at your desk side. Yeah, I love that. And from that, because I love that you've touched on the URL side, because that's been one of my things where I've, I've, I've struggled. You know, I have this great idea, but then the URL is not available. And go, oh, I can't. You know, and it is it difficult to let go from your perspective? Oh yeah. Yeah, especially because it's like you know we're 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 thoughtful creatures, right? So you got all these things. All of a sudden, you got this great idea, and you start making. You got a marketing plan in your head. Yeah. You've got this great eight hundred number, and then you, you change <laughs> the name. So um, yeah, I mean it's it's tough, and we've had some really um, you know you got to get really long in order to get anything <laughs> these days. Like if you're trying to get a three letter URL, you're not you're not going to get it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's tough to let go of them, but you, you kind of make it work. Yeah. And so with the services that you provide, you know, you're saying you're, you're creating an IT. Um, is it an IT hub at, at your desk site, or is it you know you're you're providing the the IT? What, get into. Can you explain a bit about yeah, the services sure. that you provide? Yeah. So so we have we have uh, three major bu buckets that we sit in: uh, manage, uh, security and transform. So manage would be managing anything and everything that is your technology. That's whether it's managed cloud or managed on-prem. So if it's servers on site, 
desktops on site, your firewall, or if it's Azure or AWS or Microsoft Office 365, we manage all that for you. So if you ever need anything, you just call us and we take care of it for you. Yeah. Your employees need to know how to do something or they deleted a file. They call us and we take care of it. We do a lot of, the, uh, almost 99% of everything we do is done remotely yeah. uh, so that we can actually take care of, uh, of you 24 by seven, seven days a week for those that, that that have that service. But we take care of all that stuff that is managing your, your IT. Then mm-hmm. on the security side, um, everybody knows about cybersecurity these days. And back about 10 years ago, there was a divergence between what's called an MSP and an MSSP. So an MSP is a managed services provider, and that's really coined for a technology services company for small and medium businesses. And then there's an MSSP, which is a managed security services provider. Well, when I started Deslight, I thought that was ridiculous. It's like, how could your security company not be the same as your infrastructure company? It makes no sense to me. So I merged the two, and I have a whole slew of services that we offer as a security company to make sure that you're not going to get hacked. Um, One of the other things that I'm really, really big proponent of is not every company has the same risk tolerance Mm -hmm. and not every company deserves the same set of tools. So I make sure that the baker doesn't need the same level of security as the bank, right? right? Because the baker can't afford that level of security, nor should he he or she need to, right? Yeah. Uh, So that's where the whole wheelhouse of, of, of security comes in. And then we have Transform. Transform is all about getting businesses that may have a server on site or maybe using um, older technology and say, let's transform you, put you in the cloud. Let's get that server out of there. Let's get those desktops into something that's a, a, a newer uh, um, SaaS solution or let's get into Chromebooks or there's a, there's a whole bunch of different things. But we do technology in that manner as well. So those are the three different buckets. Uh, we service companies from the smallest company I have is 10 people. Uh, the biggest company we have is uh, over 500 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we 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 have that um, knowledge base and that level of expertise that we could take care of all these different companies. Beautiful. And what are some of the key problems that people um, might have that they're not aware of? Because a lot of times when people, you know, most problems are they're dealt with when it blows up. Um, yeah. But in the IT space, it's probably not a good time to be dealing with something. What What are some key things that people should be aware of when looking at going, okay, they, to, to give them an idea of, okay, I actually got this problem. I should be reaching out to Victor because he can help me solve that before you know, my whole thing goes down and I lose all these sales or I lose all these data. And what, what are some of those key areas that people should be looking at? So Dan, that's a fantastic question. And, and the problem, the problem really is that most business owners um, don't take the time or don't have the time to learn enough about where their risks are. Yeah. Um, I actually speak on this topic. I, I, I'm on the Vistage speaking circuit. And one of the things that I talk about is an educational forum to teach business owners the things they need to look out for. And it's very, very broad. There's a lot of different things that you may think, you may have a false sense of security. Yeah, I'm secure. I got an IT guy who's taking care of my stuff. And the reality is that you're nowhere near secure, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I'm taking over companies because of what you said. Something blew up. Yeah. Uh, not too long ago, you know, one of my friends called me up and he's like, Vic, um, it's it started last week and uh, people can't log into their computers. And I said, well, don't you have an IT company? He says, yeah, they told me that something broke and I don't know what broke, but they can't fix it. And and they're in trouble. Yeah. They have an IT company there. He, the guy <laughs> had backups there and the backups failed them. So, yeah. you know, we went in and they fixed it. But the, the real issue is all about not understanding enough about technology, especially these days, to mm-hmm. know whether they're in trouble or not. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of times... <laughs> They'll do the things they think are right and put mm-hmm. it in the business and then come to find out that they're not the right things or they've yeah. spent money in places where they shouldn't have. So um, what are things that could have happened? You know, your your backups are not correct. You're paying mm-hmm. for backups all the time and all of a sudden you go and try to retrieve a file. You try to retrieve a server and you can't retrieve that server because they weren't done correctly. Yeah. Um, your fund- foundational software is not in place, right? A lot of times, especially when you're starting businesses, 
you start businesses with whatever's out there. You go to Office 365, you put it, you open up an account, they make it really easy, and then you start your business. But there, as you grow and as you have employees, if you don't have a, a place, what we call Active Directory or Azure Active Directory, where you have your credentials for all your employees in one place, so you can have like security <laughs> groups and you could have you could have distribution groups, you could have all these different things as you grow. When you're five people, not a big deal. When you're 20 people, very big deal. And it mm. starts becoming, when you're 500 people, unfixable, right? So yeah. you have those kind of things that you need a right partner. You need someone that can just hold your hand because mm. as you grow your company, IT should always be at the table with you. Because as you're talking about business yeah. problems, if you have someone that understands technology, a lot of times hiring three other people is not the right solution. <laughs> you could put a piece of software in place and then stay with that one person, right? Yeah. Um, so there's there's a slew of things, and I could keep going on and on and on. It's it's a really important point that you raise, though, because and I'm laughing as you're telling some of these stories because I've experienced it from the perspective of clients that I've worked with, where like they don't realize there's that problem, and yet the, the logins, it's like where are the passwords? <laughs> where do we even find that? And it's like. And it's it's funny how people simple things like that that they don't pay attention to. But it sounds like from that fundamental perspective, that's your focus. You go, these are the core things because IT is so critical. It's like a website. If your IT is not working, um, and I've been in in clients' offices where it shut down, the service shut down. Everyone goes out for coffee because there's nothing that no one anyone can do. Um, yeah. And it's so uh, you lose that productivity. Is that is that fundam Is that what you're talking about? That you're actually got a, a good grip on what are these fundamentals from a security perspective? A business needs to have so it continues to operate. Yeah, absolutely. So every single company that we take over, um, we have a, a, a depending on the size of the company, but it's normally a month of onboarding. Yeah. And during that month of onboarding, we sit there and collect all the information. Like one of the one of the greatest examples I, I love giving everybody is, you know how many business owners I've met, and I am not making this up, but do you know how many business owners I've met that did not own that URL? <laughs> that they had a key employee or they had you know, uh, the, 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 their cousin or their nephew actually buy their domain. And now they've got this multi-million dollar company yeah. and they don't have access to their own domain. Yeah. So it's stuff like that. And it's not because you know, they're, they're not responsible. They just don't know any better. Yeah. So we go, we onboard these companies and we go from soup to nuts and we make sure we get every single vendor. That's a technology vendor, every single contract. We make sure we understand it all. We understand the business. We take a look at everything. We say, okay, after we, the onboarding is done, uh, Mr. Business owner, these are the things we think you need to do immediately. Mm. These are the things that I we need you need to do, but we could put them into next year, next quarter, next whatever. And these are the things that I think we should do, but we can look at them once we get all this other housekeeping out of, out of the day. But yeah, somebody needs to look at it that understands technology from a a, a chief, uh, um, a, a CIO or CTO kind of uh, perspective, right? That understands both business and technology. Take a look at everything and say this is what's necessary. Yeah, it's an important point that you raised because as you talked about um, in you know, the number of businesses that you've got as an investment are because they've failed in the sense of their IT didn't work. Yeah. And I mean, business is fragile enough as it is without having that something that could have been avoided, um, avoided. Yeah. Or you spend the money like, you know, budgeting is also a big thing because I, one of my pet peeves with competitors is that a lot of my competitors will get a, um, I call it a box of tools and try to sell every single business on the same exact box. I hate that because I don't think that that's fair. Not every business mm. needs that box of, of, of services, right? Yeah. Um, and, and a business owner will go and invest in this thing because this, this advisor, this IT advisor is telling them this is the right thing to do. And now he's paying thousands of dollars a month for a service he doesn't even need. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that I look at is well, what does this particular business truly need, right? Because mm -hmm. not every business needs the same thing. Yeah. And that's an important point that you did raise. It's, it's, because I've seen it so much where people are paying for software and things that they're actually not using or even if they are using, they're probably using it to about 5% of its capacity, which affects the dollar side of things. And when we're talking about you know, being efficient, you you understand the business side of things and how to link that IT to the, the dollars and, and the net profit that you're making. Yeah. I mean, when we started my wife's business, and, I, and I'm an IT guy, I understand technology as 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 good as anyone else out there. 
when we started my wife's business, I started her off with an Excel spreadsheet. Here's yeah. PPNL. This is how we're going to do everything, right? <laughs> I started her off with nothing. And then, you know, quickly, we ended up into a, an accounting package. We ended up into automation. Now she's yeah. fully automated. And she's really working. But she didn't need that at the time. She had to take that money and spend it in all the stuff that she needed, you know, the mattresses and the pillows and all the things that she needed to buy. Mm. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're actually giving um, companies an efficient platform to manage their IT so they can actually use those that surplus cash resources elsewhere rather than spending, like you say, $1,000 a month on stuff that they don't need. Yeah, I, I am giving uh, companies that um, don't can't afford that high-level IT department, right? Because when you talk about an IT department, you're talking about, about five different people that have five very different functions, right? Mm -hmm. I give that to small and medium businesses for one low monthly price. So yeah. they have their uh, architect that can engineer stuff and a C-level guy that can actually sit there and understand their business. They have a help desk guy that they can call when they need it. They have a project guy that they can do when they need to do IT projects. And they have a project manager that can actually manage those projects. That's really, really expensive if you start talking about These are all six-figure people, right? Yes. So you start talking about it, that's half a million dollars a year. Small businesses don't have that. So we package that up and we give it to small businesses on a monthly matter in, a, in an amount that they can afford specific to their business. Love that. Love that. And what's the best way? Is it Well, before we move on to the, the context, I think, is there anything else from the business that you'd, you'd like to, to share that you think would be of value to to the listeners? I One thing I do tell all the listeners of every single podcast that I go on, do I am all over LinkedIn. Um, yeah. I, I have a pretty big social media, both desk side and myself have uh, big mm -hmm. social media presences. Do not be shy about reaching out to me. Um, if, if free of charge. There is no, I'm not looking to make a sale. Just if you have a question, shoot me out, DM me. Um, I would love to help. Yeah. And, and what's the best way to, that people should contact you? You mentioned LinkedIn and, and you're, you're very easy to find there on LinkedIn, but if you want to share that URL or, or we'll put it in the show yeah. notes. The, you, yeah. So deathside.com is the, is the, the company address. Um, so you can definitely find all our, all Deathside's um, social media platforms are on there. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as Victor Calabrese. Um, definitely connect with me. Um, you can find me through that side or, or whatever. Uh, if you want to sit, know more about my book, go to accessing your true potential.com. Um, and you could learn more about and I'm there. There's going to be all my social media platforms. Fantastic. Beautiful. Now, we're winding up, but if you were to share, and it doesn't have to be a business, it can be about anything, what are either you know some of your key or can be one or, or several key wisdoms that you think the audience should take away from this session? I, I will go and uh, beat up on continuous learning. I think that your audience has made a smart decision listening to your podcast, right? Uh, because it is a way of uh, learning um, and they should keep doing that sort of stuff. Whether you're young or old, never stop learning. I think that's one of the things I talk about in the book is is the minute you start, you stop learning is the minute you start dying uh, because your brain actually needs that to keep it in shape. Just like your body needs exercise, your brain just needs stimulation and learning is how you stimulate your brain. Fantastic. Love that, Victor. Victor Calbrese, director and owner of Deathside. It's been a pleasure to have you on board on this show, have this discussion. I've really, really enjoyed it. I've learned so much from it. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thank you, Dean. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.